Hey y'all, Scott here, and it truly is absolutely astonishing what can happen in 10 years. Hey y'all, Future Scott here, and welcome to 2027, where I wear a chef hat now, and where Robo Ebola reigns supreme. It's a 2027 thing, you wouldn't understand. Man, I was expecting to see a gravestone, but a robo-ebola epidemic works too. But I think it's about time we roll the clock back 10 years instead to the release of one of the greatest things Nintendo ever spat out. This. This right here is my favorite game of all time. Super Mario Galaxy was the perfect blend of everything Mario did prior, but pummeling in a hearty dose of new and innovation. Development of Mario Galaxy can be traced all the way back to the introduction of the GameCube. In 2000, at Nintendo's Space World trade show, Shigeru Miyamoto showed off a tech demo entitled Super Mario 128. The name was not only supposed to insinuate it was a sequel to Super Mario 64, but also describe exactly what it was, 128 Marios. Not only did it show off how many characters could be displayed on a GameCube game, but also displayed shifting terrain and characters walking on planet-like spheres. Miyamoto consistently pleaded that Mario 128 was still being worked on in the coming years, saying that it was more than a tech demo, which ended up being a load of garbage. In 2007, Miyamoto confirmed Mario 128 was merely just a tech demo to show off the power of the GameCube, yet they took the technology employed in the demo and used it on other games. Mario 128 became this sex of a game, Metroid Prime, Twilight Princess, and Super Mario Galaxy. Development was headed by Nintendo EAD Tokyo. In 2005, they recently wrapped up development of Donkey Kong Jungle Beat and wanted to make a Mario game that was a real crowd pleaser, something that turned every dial in the house as far to the right as possible, a cinematic, epic Mario game. They wanted to expand upon Mario 128's spherical platforms, and the idea of them being planets obviously made sense, so the outer space setting was determined there. Galaxy was shown off at E3 2006 and was planned as a launch title for the Wii at one point, but the developers wanted to take their sweet time, and the launch of the game was delayed to November 2007, November 1st for Japan, November 16th for Europe, and November 12th for here in North America. Not only is the 12th of November World Pneumonia Day, but also the day when boys became men, girls became women, and the term Nirvana started making a whole lot more sense because this thick honker was released in North America. 10 years, man, that is nuts. Back when Wii discs looked like they were made with only three different colored Sharpies and Madden 08 was justifiably the latest and greatest. The story here is the same thing as the last century of Mario games, but with some zazz. Mario is invited to the Star Festival of Peach's Castle, Bowser crashes the party with a UFO. He rips the entirety of Peach's Castle out of the ground as a means to kidnap Peach. Well, Mario is blasted away by Kamek and is awoken by a star creature named Luma on a small planet where he meets up with Rosalina, the protector of galaxies. She reveals that Bowser had stolen the power stars that help power her ship, the Comet Observatory, and Mario will have to go to various galaxies to collect these stars back to help power the ship so they can traverse to the center of the universe to rescue Peach. The story works so well in Galaxy, at no point does it really feel like the creators are saying, alright guys, hear me out on this. Everything works so well in the context of the game. It's the tried and true Mario lore we've gotten used to, but with a cinematic feel. Galaxy basically wants you to audibly gasp at everything they throw at you story-wise, and I kinda love it because of that. Galaxy can make a run-of-the-mill trope of a Mario game feel like a life or death situation. In recent Mario games like Super Mario Odyssey, Bowser looks like he needs tuba music accompanying his every move. When I see him, my only thought is, man, I gotta get out of here, what if he sits on me? In Galaxy, Bowser actually feels like a threat, all based on the game's amazing presentation. This is not only one of the best looking Wii games, but one of the best looking Mario games out there. Yeah, the graphics don't look as smooth as forthcoming games such as 3D World, but my god, the colors, the lighting, the art design, it all culminates into a game that's a joy to look at and feels like they truly got the most out of the hardware this game is on. And the music is <laughs> worthy. I believe this is the first Mario game with an orchestrated score. They did this to give the game a more epic feeling, and man oh man, what a score. Not all the tracks are fully orchestrated, but Galaxy is home to some of the greatest Mario and Nintendo music ever created. There's such a good variety of old remixes, new classics, and themes that just add to the flavor seizure that your eyes are witnessing. So Mario Galaxy looks fantastic, sounds brilliant, and has what I would consider the perfect Mario story. But none of that matters if the game blows. Mario Galaxy was touted by Nintendo as the true successor to Mario 64. In one sense, this is the first worthy successor to Super Mario 64. You see, there was this game that came after 64 entitled Super Mario Sunshine, but Nintendo decided the game was too Super Mario Sunshiny to be considered a Mario 64 sequel. Super Mario Galaxy follows the basic format of prior 3D Mario games, being of course 64 and Sunshine, but adds a large pot of linearity to the mix. 
Galaxy features a tremendous amount of levels, coined as galaxies, to explore in comparison to its two predecessors. Select a galaxy, select a mission, and complete it by nabbing the Power Star at the end. These missions are incredibly straightforward when looking at them next to 64 and Sunshine. Like I said, these three games follow a similar format, the difference being in how the levels are designed. Prior games featured far fewer yet bigger levels, which allowed them to cram more missions in each of them, and in some cases allow players to select a specific mission, but complete a different one. Galaxy has much smaller levels and less wiggle room for the player to explore. 64 and Sunshine leave a lot to the player to figure out and discover on their own, while with Galaxy, 90% of the time it is uproariously apparent what you're supposed to do the second you enter a level. This sounds like a negative aspect of the game, and for some it is. Galaxy takes more inspiration from 2D Mario games in terms of the player's objectives, as it's much more linear and straightforward. I love the open sandbox style of Mario game that 64 and Sunshine are, and overall I'd say I have more of an appreciation towards that style of gameplay and level design, but man, Galaxy is just so much fun and so freaky brilliant with how it executes its concepts that I love both of these styles equally. Oh, 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 and this game has some insane gravity mechanics. Mario Galaxy utilizes the sphere walking technology from Mario 128, and it definitely made this game stick out hard. You can literally walk all around a planet. Sometimes it can be a little weird, but it can be insanely easy to get used to. It's really amazing how they can make this mechanic that seems like it would have been overly complicated, be simply second nature. You ever wonder what it would be like if they made Jesus the game? Oh wait, Mario is a Christ figure in this game, he controls fantastically. It may be just me, but I feel like they tweaked Mario's controls so he'd feel completely one with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck combo used in the game. When Mario crouches, I feel it, man. Like, they made him look a bit more boxy to look like the Z button. I mean, it may be just me, but I think he looks like a Z button, which makes crouching fun, moving around is fun, performing pro moves like triple jumping, wall jumping, long jumping, it's all fun and feels great. Of course, the big new addition to Mario's moveset is spinning. Flick the Wii Remote to make Mario spin, which can be used to defeat enemies and also give you some extra airtime. 64 and Sunshine both had their own forms of attacking, with 64 having this rank punch and kick, and Sunshine having flood, allowing you to use water to hover or stun enemies. However, I'd say the spin is the most useful attack. I can't say flood wasn't incredibly versatile and useful as a platforming tool, but attack-wise, spinning is so satisfying when you directly hit an enemy, man. It works so incredibly well. You may think flicking the Wii Remote for this attack would be incredibly hit and miss, but I've never had a problem with the Wii Remote misreading my movements. Galaxy makes tremendous use of the Wii Remote's technology. It's definitely here, but doesn't take center stage. This is a true Mario game, with motion control elements supplementing it. But I'd say the Wii Remote's pointer functionality is more prevalent here than motion. Nearly all the time during gameplay, you can point the Wii Remote at the screen and the star cursor will appear, allowing you to immediately collect a new item in the game known as Star Bits. Star Bits were basically implemented in the game due to the amount of quick cutscenes of Mario flying through space. These don't require player input, so most of the time during these sections, there's a hefty supply of Star Bits for you to collect while Mario is zooming to the next planet to keep you interested. Star Bits can net you more one-ups and also be used to feed hungry Lumas to access new galaxies and planets within levels. There's also pull stars, which require you to point the remote at them and grab it with with A to pull Mario towards them, these wads of gum you have to pull back to fling Mario forward, and missions that turn your cursor into a can of compressed air to blow Mario within a bubble throughout a treacherous obstacle course. Of course, there are sections that require the use of extensive motion control as well. As stated, spinning requires flicking the Wii Remote and launch stars require a swift flick to launch Mario into space. These are amazing. Not only do these trigger some wicked neat and quick animations, but they're so satisfying to trigger. Power-ups return in Mario Galaxy, and a fair amount of them depend on the waggle of the Wii Remote. I gotta be honest, the power-ups in Galaxy are nothing special. They're cool ideas, but either they have a time limit or just not that fun to use. The headliner is the Bee Mushroom, which transforms you into Bee Mario. You can fly for a very brief period of time and can stand on flowers and clouds while also being able to cling and traverse honeycomb walls. I always found it weird that puddles of honey still slowed Bee Mario down though. It felt like moseying through honey with no problems would have been an easy advantage to give to this power up. The Boo Mushroom turns you into a Boo with the shake of a Wii Remote turning you invisible to go through some objects. The Fire Flower makes a return in the form of a timed power up. Flicking the Wii Remote throws fireballs for a short period. The S Flower allows Mario to turn water and lava into platformable ice with a shake allowing Mario to skate on it. The Spring Mushroom turns Mario into this ungodly creature and allows for some insane jumps, but at the cost of being an awkward mess to control. The Rainbow Star is an invincibility power-up, and the most underwhelming power-up in the whole game is the Red Star. Underwhelming because this is actually a great power-up, but it's so underutilized that it saddens me greatly. It allows you to fly and controls extraordinarily well, I just wish it was in some actual stages. Power-ups are completely context-sensitive. They're only available in very specific instances, and they mostly don't feel like a power-up, but more so just an excuse for a change of pace. 
but who could forget everybody's favorite motion-controlled segments of Galaxy, the rolling ball, the manta ray, and the trash stages. Hold the Wii Remote like a joystick to control Mario on a rolling ball. Get to the goal and get to the star, but my god, I think they programmed this ball to make sure the player is breathing extensively through their nose while controlling it. It's pretty stressful, but nowhere near that hard or annoying. With the Manta Ray sections, you point the Wii Remote at the screen and turn it like a key to ride the Manta Ray and control where it goes. I always found these missions to be far harder than the Rolling Ball ones. It just goes so much faster and it's so easy to fall out of the water. We also have the worst part of the entire game, cleaning up the robot Guillermo's trash. Throw the bombs to blow up the trash. You have a pretty strict time limit. You truly have to have a nearly perfect run to succeed here. This guy acts ungrateful when I don't get all the trash blown up in 30 seconds. What realities does this game live in? You have to throw the bombs where these golden dots are for perfection, but man, did I not know that on my first rodeo. I feel like everybody mentions these motion control missions in the game and make it seem as if Galaxy is filled to the brim with these things. Don't be fooled, these types of missions only appear two to three times in the entire game. Out of the 121 stars to collect, these barely scratch the surface. Galaxy has a plethora of variety in its missions. It truly doesn't get boring or repetitive. And this is finally the portion where I can talk about some specific levels and things and oh me, oh my, please excuse me, this is my favorite game of all time. Honey, have Galaxy get in my mouth, this is such a charming level. All the beats are floating around and you get to traverse Queen B. Look how good this looks. Racing against Boo in the Ghost of Galaxy via the Pole Stars was intense, but man, it was so satisfying to win. And the boss fight in that area, Boulder guys. Oh my god, what a boss. King Caliente. Oh, you gotta wham the rocks back at him, and it's so satisfying. Like, here comes a bitch, do a little jump. Wham! Gussie Garden Galaxy is sex. The Toy Time Galaxy is amazing. It's just so much fun to play through. I love it. The opening section. Oh, this is where it all began. And what an intro. It's so beautiful and peaceful. Look at those a few moments. Rosalina's backstory is told through a storybook. You get more and more chapters to throughout the game. And holy moly, it's a downer and a half, but holy Holy moly, a Mario character with a backstory. Prankster comics appear in the older stages that bring harder versions of stars you already completed into the mix, and one of them being a race against... <laughs> this bastard! Completing the game with all the stars gets you nothing. Super Luigi Galaxy! Pardon me, you get Luigi. Ah! Nintendo didn't change the missions where you have to rescue Luigi, so it's Luigi rescuing Luigi, but still, it's nice to get something for completing the game. It's way better than Sunshine, which didn't give you diddles for completing it. Speaking of which, I feel like this game's difficulty is just right, especially compared to Sunshine. With Sunshine, I always had to ask the game what's so funny, while Galaxy is a comfortable romp that isn't too easy, but can get a little feisty sometimes. Especially Luigi's purple coins. This thing was straight up anxiety attack my first time around. The Comet Observatory is a wonderful hub. It's not as fun to Explorers, Peach's Castle in Mario 64, or Isle Delfino in Sunshine, but man, the music, the visuals, they all add up to such a great place to roam around to go level to level. The Bowser battles, oh my god, the most memorable thing about the game, whacking Bowser, seeing him spin across the planet with the orchestrated music in the background, the chorus chanting, this is what society led up to. This game truly had my attention the moment it started up, just the way Mario runs toward the Star Festival with his arms out gets me every time, it's just so charming. This was the first Mario game I really, really, really got into. As a kid, I played a lot of Super Mario World, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario Bros. 3, the original, and I dabbled in Mario 64 and Sunshine, but Galaxy truly engrossed me. This is not just a game, but truly an experience and a masterpiece at that. Yeah, it's more linear than Mario 64 and Sunshine, which some may dislike, but I believe the minds behind this game did this because that was truly the perfect vision for what Galaxy should be. Galaxy was conceptualized as a 3D Mario that was more accessible to novice players, and I think it succeeded greatly. It's easy for more to pick up compared to 64 and Sunshine, but it's not dumbed down for veterans. The game Super Mario 3D World does this as well, being a 3D Mario game that plays just like a 2D one, but I prefer the way Galaxy executed the more accessible 3D Mario idea. 3D World had less memorable level and art design, while Galaxy is one of the most memorable games out there. Recently, Super Mario Odyssey released to critical acclaim, and with its return to the non-linear sandbox style of the first two 3D games, many would say that that is their new favorite Mario game. Dude, I can totally see why. Odyssey is a masterpiece, and objectively, one could say it's better than Galaxy. But Galaxy means so much to me. It's a phenomenal experience. It's all up to preference, and while the future of Mario is looking brighter than ever with Odyssey, Galaxy will always be not only my favorite Mario game, but my favorite game of all time. If they were to ever end the Mario series, I think Galaxy would have been a perfect way to end it. But blam, we'll get to that eventually. Of course, with the game's elements of the great beyond, one may wonder, is any of this possible in the distant crevices of outer space? And that's why I constructed the Mario Galaxy probability formula. It formulates the percent chance of the probability of giant bees in outer space. It's zero. Hey, 
deliberately left this one out to avoid this from happening. Hey y'all, 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 hey Welcome to New Location McGee, as she likes to be called it. Old Location McGee and I had a bit of a falling out. Well, at least we have so much more room for activities. And heh, the ambiance of this place is crazy. This is the first time I've ever experienced what charm smells like, and it smells a whole lot like piss. Well, in terms of what to talk about first, I guess I can look at exactly how many games I promised to take a look at soon. Jesus Christ. All right, let's just get this one out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Super Mario Galaxy 2 was originally developed as a remixed and expanded version of the original Mario Galaxy, with Nintendo EAD initiating development right after the release of the first game. They just kept coming up with more ideas, and I think we can all understand why. The entire concept of Super Mario Galaxy had, and still has, so much potential. Galaxy 1 didn't not feel fully realized or incomplete in any way. It just felt like the game's concept could easily warrant a sequel. Under the development names of Super Mario Galaxy More and Super Mario Galaxy 1.5, the team realized they actually wanted to sell the game, so they gave it the title of Super Mario Galaxy 2, achieving full sequel status. This was actually because the new ideas they were cramming into this thing just started to overload the expansion they were developing, and it was enough to consider it a full-blown sequel. At E3 2009, the penultimate big reveal of Nintendo's press conference was Super Mario Galaxy 2, sporting a tall logo, showcasing Yoshi being brought into the mix, new galaxies to explore some new concepts, and that was about it. It was truly more of Mario Galaxy. About a year later in North America, it was released on May 23rd, 2010, with a May 27th release for Japan and a June 11th release for Europe. This game just started to roll in the praise. If you thought Super Mario Galaxy was a critical success, you're a moron, look at this! Jesus, man, people absolutely adored this game. Now, with this in mind, and Mario Galaxy being my favorite game of all time, you'd think I, nope, I bought it three years later. Yeah, I mean, give me a break. I was 13 in 2010. I was more so worried about what flavor of Capri Sun was in my lunch. Plus, I couldn't drive. I didn't have 50 bucks to spend on a new Wii game at whim. Whatever. Come 2013, I find it at a used game store, and I'm like, yeah. I picked it up. I played it. I loved it. I stopped about a quarter of the way through. I don't know, man. I think I just got distracted with other things, but recently, I finally sat down and played through the whole game. Let's talk about it. Super Mario Galaxy 2 picks up right where the last one left off. Gotcha! Galaxy 2's story is told via this storybook method and starts things off with the Star Festival, a celebration that happens every 100 years. Rewind to Galaxy 1 where it starts things off with the Star Festival, a celebration that happens every 100 years. Yeah, it's weird. Super Mario Galaxy 2 is kind of a retelling, reimagining, whatever you want to call it, of the first galaxy. Let me just quickly recap the first one. Bowser kidnaps Peach. In this one, the Bowser kidnaps Peach, but with a much more light-hearted, almost comedic tone. Galaxy 1 was meant to be taken a bit more seriously than other Mario games, especially after Sunshine. Scenes were much more dramatic with intense lighting and a booming orchestra. Peach getting kidnapped by Bowser is an everyday occurrence, but Galaxy 1 not only had us exploring the cosmos to get her back, but introduced us to Rosalina, who helped us out by allowing the use of her ship, the Comet Observatory, and she also had some actual backstory. Completely optional backstory, but hey, it was still there. Shigeru Miyamoto wanted Galaxy 2 to have as little story as possible, and it shows. They do manage to stuff a good amount of cute plot in here, I guess, but the problem I have with this isn't the light story, it's completely disregarding the first game even happened, or just flat out ignoring a ton of elements of it. Yeah, at the end of the first game, Rosalina resets the events of everything, but Mario still remembers what happens, and Galaxy 2 just acts as more of a reimagining of the same events from 1. I get it, they wanted the game to be more accessible to newcomers, but already naming it Super Mario Galaxy 2 is gonna deter some people. Might as well come up with a more clever plot that both returning Galaxy fans and newcomers can enjoy. I mean, I don't care about it that much, but the plot and ambiance of Galaxy 1 was some of the best in the main Mario series, was far from intrusive, and didn't bog the game down in any way. So to see it downplayed so much here, in my opinion, 
is a bit of a shame. Anyways, the opening section starts off in 2D and gradually turns 3D, which I always thought was really smart, both a showcase for the progression of the Mario series and helping to ease newcomers into the game. Once you meet up with the baby Luma, it then gives you the ability to spin attack. You see a Bowser the size of Mongolia wreaking havoc on the castle, he kidnaps Peach, go. After completing the first level, you're thrown onto a ship run by Lubba, Luma equivalent to that wacky uncle we all have. Grab power stars to power the ship to get to Bowser, easy peasy. And with that, the best way to describe Super Mario Galaxy 2 would be it's as if Super Mario Galaxy just kept on going. I gotta be honest, nothing screams evolution or progression about this one. It's just more Mario Galaxy levels. Nothing drastic was changed or improved, just differences in how the levels are presented to us. We'll get to that in a sec. Should anybody complain about it? God no! What really needed improved with Mario Galaxy to begin with? I think any problems people have with the game are just based on Galaxy's formula of more linear level design, and even then, I think you have to admit, it's not bad, it's just probably not for you. There weren't many definitive problems with the original game, so with a sequel, I almost think it would have to be on an all new, more powerful platform to be more distinct from the original. With this being Super Mario Galaxy 2, this of course means that Galaxy's mechanics are all brought over. From what I can tell, everything is retained from the first game. You can jump, crouch, long jump, wall jump, spin by shaking the Wii remote, it's all back and still feels great. Gravity is still a key aspect of the gameplay here as we can walk all around various terrains. However, it's definitely downplayed compared to the first game. Don't get me wrong, Galaxy 2 still does a ton with gravity, but it felt like the first game flaunted it a lot more. 2 is more so concerned with using it when it benefits the level design. One thing Galaxy 2 definitely does differently is the difficulty. This isn't the hardest game out there by any means, but it's definitely much more difficult than the first game. I welcome the challenge. While Galaxy 1 was never painfully easy to the point where it was boring, it only really got challenging near the very, very end of a 120 star playthrough. Galaxy 2 definitely puts up more of a challenge, and that makes it more interesting if you're playing both games back to back. If you're way past lame at a certain level though, and die like way too many times in a row, the game offers the cosmic spirit as a helping hand, taking the form of a ghostly Rosalina. It'll complete the level for you, no thank you. Like I said, Mario Galaxy 2 feels like more of Mario Galaxy 1, but with some changes to its format. Galaxy 1 was a much more linear take on 3D Mario games. Most missions were more so getting from point A to point B compared to Mario 64's and Sunshine's, which were much more open-ended. Mario Galaxy 2 takes the linearity from Galaxy 1, takes a highlighter to it, and does unspeakable things. Galaxy 1 didn't really have a lot of exploratory levels. The main one I remember that kind of felt like that would be the Honey Hive Galaxy. And even then, calling that a super open-ended level is kinda hyperbole. Galaxy 2 focuses a lot more on obstacle course-like stages. There's not a ton of exploration here at all. Galaxies in this game feel more like a series of platforming challenges. It doesn't feel out of place compared to the first game, though. First off, Galaxy 1 had its fair share of obstacle course-like designs, and also, we're in space, anything can happen. A giant block of wood, it's in space, it makes sense. I think the best way to describe it would be imagine if Super Mario 3D World was way more interesting in terms of its design. Galaxy 2 is platform challenge after platform challenge. Also, this game is way, way, way more fast paced than the first game. It feels like the game is constantly shaking you, telling you to get on with it and select the level, get to the end. With more linear designs, that means there's not as many Power Star missions in each galaxy. There's only about three per stage, but that means we get loads more unique galaxies, so it feels like every other minute, Galaxy 2 throws a brand new idea in your face. Of course, this is a 3D Mario game, so you have to get to these levels somehow. The first game featured the hub world known as the Comet Observatory, which was cool, but had very little in terms of things to do in it. You just enter different rooms to access the levels. Galaxy 2 uses this, Starship Mario. Compared to the Comet Observatory, this thing is the size of a nickel. However, there's far more to do here. There's more characters to talk to, and there's more things to screw around with. I wish it was much bigger though, everything feels really cramped. But all this is completely optional. The meat and potatoes here is the front of the ship. Step on this pad and you're taken to the world map, a way to get you straight to the action. Many have compared the world map in Galaxy 2 to older 2D Mario games, and to that I say, what 2D Mario games were you playing? This is fundamentally just a straight line. You don't really get much of a choice as to which level you tackle next. Every now and then you hit a fork in the road and get to choose, but the majority of the time, 
The game tells you you have to beat a certain level to progress. That's fine, but definitely a bit different compared to the first game. The world map is way less interesting, but does make things a bit quicker to just hop into a level. However, there's some really odd bloat here for a game so hell-bent on getting you into the action as quickly as possible. Like take for example, on the world map you may encounter a hungry Luma, these you have to feed a certain amount of star bits you've collected to access a new pathway to new levels. Clicking on them, calls them to Starship Mario. You then have to walk up to them, talk to them, feed them, they transform, then you have to go back to the world map to access the levels. Why? Why not just do this whole thing when you click the Luma on the map screen? For a game that's so adamant about just shoving your face into new levels, this always stuck out to me as an odd design choice. Also, a brand new collectible in the levels are the Comet Medals. After you collect them, the Prankster Comet version of that level will become playable, which is a remixed, more difficult version of that stage, whether that be putting it under a strict time limit, giving you only one sliver of health, that kind of stuff. Here's the thing though, while I like the idea of the Comet Medals, they were never a challenge to obtain. I grabbed almost every single one of them my first time through the levels, so to me, they never really held much value at all. Of course, for the medals that I didn't find my first time around, it was a bit of a chore to go through the levels I 100% completed otherwise all over again just to get the medal. It's just an extra step to unlock the prankster comments. In the first game, they kind of appeared randomly after grabbing most of the power stars in the corresponding level. All right, I just whined about a sequel to my favorite game of all time long enough. Let's get into the main portion of the game, the levels. <laughs> oh. God, this is good! Chompworks Galaxy, oh my god, it's like you're part of a Rube Goldberg contraption trying to get a chain shot from point A to B. Cloudy Core Galaxy might even be sexier than Gusty Garden Galaxy from the first game. Puzzle Plank, god, what a boppin' tune. Every single time you blink, this game throws something new at you. It's insane! Flipsville is just neato, not gonna lie. Throwback Galaxy? Only Super Mario Galaxy can rehash so much and get away with it. Jesus, the absolute size of this boss fight. This game is absolutely fantastic, it's amazing. It has some of the best level design out there. It does some things differently compared to the first game, and they aren't bad changes by any means, they're just different. It helps differentiate the two games more, because while I don't think Galaxy 2 had to be wildly different from the first game, let's be honest, putting the two games side to side, it might be pretty hard to tell which one is which. I welcome the changes to the format. But I'm a Galaxy 1 guy personally, that's why the whining just had to be there. I think both games are equally good when you get down to it, so considering which one is better, it's more so down to personal preference. But let's talk more Galaxy 2. The most obvious new additions to this game are as follows. Yoshi. Yeah, Yoshi finally makes his Galaxy debut in the sequel, and it was definitely worth the wait. Hop on him, and now your cursor turns into a Yoshi Tongue Passport, allowing it to get to all kinds of places it shouldn't be able to. Yoshi also has various things he can eat up to gain certain powers, turning into a giant balloon, illuminating hidden passageways, and zipping through an entire level. These are a blast, and really solidify Yoshi as being one of the best additions to this game. But Yoshi isn't the only one getting new power-ups. Most of Mario's power-ups function the same as they did in the previous game, as in they all have that that glorious contact sensitivity. Most are only really here to give you a break from the standard hop and bop action. All power-ups that were in Galaxy 1 reappear here, except for the Ice Flower and Red Star. I mean, those wouldn't be the power-ups I would remove personally, but whatever. The power-ups introduced in this game kind of make up for it. The Spindrill, Rock Mushroom, and Cloud Flower. The Spindrill and Rock Mushroom are kind of in the same camp. They're fun to use, but of course are only really useful in specific instances. The spin drill allows you to drill into the ground and come out the other side, and the rock mushroom allows you to pummel through hordes of enemies or break certain objects. Cool power-ups, but they pale in comparison to the cloud flower. You can walk on clouds and create up to three of your own, so you can save yourself from impending doom or get some serious height. Now this is what I like to see in a power-up, something that makes me say I WANT THAT rather than looks like I have to use that now. Now this is where I would talk about the game's graphics and sound, but what's there to say? There's really not much it does better than Galaxy 1. 2 uses a blue sky more so than pure space for the background accompanying levels, the music is still orchestral bliss. There's not much to say about it other than it continues what Galaxy 1 did, and the graphics and sound are both phenomenal. After going through six worlds, we're face to face with the final level, Bowser's Galaxy Generator. And oh god, this might be one of the greatest final levels out there. It feels like a major test, a culmination of tons of things the game has thrown at you to this point. It all ends with a battle against Bowser, which is fundamentally very similar to other boss fights with Bowser in the game. But then after you think you landed that one last hit, for God's sakes, Mario games have to stop doing this whole, wow, you beat the final boss, just kidding. 
Oh my god, this is absolutely amazing. It's over. God, this final section of the final boss fight was so cool, but it ends right before it's getting good. It just ends too quick. I wanted it to last longer. And thus, the game ends with a cameo from Rosalina, and we can play around behind the credits. That's fun. Well, since I haven't fully beaten this game until now, I think it's only fair that I 100% it. That was a blood clot of a good time. Definitely much harder than the first galaxy, but I totally feel fulfilled. I wonder what I get for getting all the stars. No. Yeah, after getting 120 stars in the game, 120 more green stars appear across every single level. They're nothing more than just click on a green star mission, find the green star in the level. There's no hints as to where it is except for a vague sound clue, just a giant game of hide and seek. You get one final super hard level at the end of it all after nabbing all green stars, but guess what? No thank you. I think after a 120 star playthrough, this is kind of the last thing I want to do. Before you say, well, Galaxy 1 had you 100% the entire game a second time as Luigi to get that final level. That final level was just putting a bunch of purple coins in the opening section of the game. Who cares? I didn't really. Just like how I don't care to get all the green stars, at least right now that is. Maybe in a year or so I'll go for it, but right now the green stars feel like filler, extending the length of a game that didn't need its length extended. So Super Mario Galaxy 2. It's phenomenal. However, I'll always prefer Galaxy 1, and it's totally a nostalgia and an emotional attachment sort of deal. I totally get why many prefer Galaxy 2. In a lot of cases, it feels like Galaxy 2 looks at everything Galaxy 1 did and says, <laughs> that's cute, and just ups the ante. More levels, more ideas, more galaxy. But to round up why I prefer Galaxy 1, allow me to introduce my brand new reoccurring segment. Why I prefer Galaxy 1 to 2, I am running out of ideas for new segments. Galaxy 1 did it all first, so it's just a bit more special to me. The setup and story isn't as cool as Galaxy 1. I prefer the format of Galaxy 1. While 2's ideas can be cooler, 1's levels were just a bit more memorable to me. Galaxy 2 has way more filler and reuses way more ideas than 1. Now, am I wrong for preferring Galaxy 1 to 2? Yeah, probably. Well, after wasting so much time getting 120 stars in Mario Galaxy 2, I've spent no time bringing in the dough to pay some rent. But I caught these landlords hard. You see, the water here is free. All I have to do is bottle up some tap water, sell the water bottles at a water bottle stand for profit, and then I'm gonna be living on paying my rent on Time Avenue. So that's what a surplus is. Hey all, Scott here. It's truly an awful situation when you re-experience something you initially loved, but upon further inspection, it's just not as good as you remember it being. I'm of course talking about Eczema. Tried it again, wasn't into it. Anyways, I'm gonna replay Mario 3D Land. 3D Mario, a staple of 3D Mario games. The 3D Mario lineage is an important one. Every single game stands on its own as a monumental moment in gaming history, each one bringing with it innovations in design, control, playstyle, and just gaming in general. A new 3D Mario game was, is, and forever will be an event. They don't happen all the time, but when they do, they scared the shit out of me. They don't happen all the time. This isn't normal. Each 3D Mario is unique and special in their own way, and most people take playing through each and every one as a sign of being human. But every family has a daughter you don't dislike. Super Mario 3D Land for the Nintendo 3DS. Yes, this is one of the best Nintendo 3DS games ever made. It saved the system from performing slightly below expectations. It successfully transitioned 3D Mario into 3D Mario. It uses the Y button. How come people don't talk about it? Whenever 3D Mario comes up, 3D Land is very, very rarely thrown into the combo. Was there a statewide ban or am I just talking to the wrong people? Because the Sonoko cashier had nothing to say about this. Well, that Nintendo 3DS was something special, wasn't it? Basically, a DS with a fancy new area and a 3D screen that doesn't need glasses. Sure, I'll bite. What kind of games are on it? You sure you don't want to talk about the headphone jack? Yeah, the 3DS was struggling throughout its first year on the market with a lack of heavy hitting titles. We got Ocarina of Time 3D, Star Fox 64 3D, and games like Pilot Wings Resort and Steel Diver, but these were remakes or such minute titles that nobody really had much of a reason to blow 250 bones on three terrible cameras. There was pretty much nothing too awful worthwhile to play on the handheld for that first year, but that didn't mean it didn't have promise. We knew about so many big games coming in the future. Buying a 3DS in 2011 was more of an investment, if anything. Kid Icarus, Animal Crossing, Resident Evil, Paper Mario, Mario Kart, Metal Gear, Kingdom Hearts, Smash Brothers, you may have had to play Pokemon Rumble Blast, but considering what was coming, it was worth it. 
maybe. Especially since we were getting a brand new 3D Mario game for the portable. Now, this was big news. This was 2011. We were hot off the heels of Super Mario Galaxy 2 releasing in 2010. That was considered a good video game. So when they were making another video game, I think we had every right to believe it would be good. But of course, what made this special was the fact it was a 3D Mario game in your hands. Now, 2D Marios have been a constant on the Nintendo handhelds, but back in November 2010, Shigeru Miyamoto confirmed that they were not only developing a new 2D Mario for the 3DS, but a 3D one as well. To be fair, Super Mario 64 DS holds the record for first portable 3D Mario game, but it was a remake of Super Mario 64, so give it back. Formally revealed on March 2nd, 2011 at the Game Developers Conference, Super Mario for Nintendo 3DS looked exactly how you'd expect it to. I mean, hearing that they're making a new 3D Mario game and seeing these screenshots, it is one. It looked like a mixture of the more typical theming of Super Mario 64 with the streamlined yet out there level design of Super Mario Galaxy 2. It looked quality, but where's the tail? You may notice something that looks like a tail at the bottom on the logo. Oh, I'm not pissed. 2011 was right when many game developers were starting to actually react to the retro boom. The internet was always going on and on about how the world was better in 1990. Remember how Super Mario Bros. 3 came out? Loads of retro game discussions consisted of how Super Mario Bros. 3 on the NES was the best Mario game of all time, and one of the core reasons often given was the awesome power-ups. And the big one at display here was Raccoon Mario, being able to whack enemies with your tail and glide and fly. Yeah, you were a raccoon, of course you could do that. Obviously, loads of nostalgia and love for Super Mario Bros. 3 existed and still exists, so Nintendo decided to capitalize on that by injecting a bit of Mario 3 into Mario 3D. I mean, this was awesome. Just the idea of being able to fly like you could in that old game made this one infinitely more interesting, because as it stood, there wasn't a ton to get excited about outside of it being a new 3D Mario on a handheld. So when E3 2011 came around, Nintendo had a ton of oddly shaped screens at their press conference that they finally decided to put some use to. They had these CGI animations representing the major Nintendo 3DS games they were about to go into detail about, and one of them was for Mario 3D. Yes, Mario comes in, jumps around, and gets a power-up. I never cared for Mario, but I'm liking the new direction. This power-up ended up being the Tanuki Suit. Yay! So not necessarily Raccoon Mario from Mario 3, rather Tanuki Mario from Mario 3. It was the exact same power-up, except it was more suit than severed raccoon ears. And you could turn into a statue. So not much is lost here, it's basically the same power-up. We then dive into the first trailer for Super Mario 3D, as it was called at the time, and there he is, Tanuki Mario. He can whip his tail and hover, Oh, here's the flying. So you bring back Tanuki Mario from Mario 3 to end up just leaving out the entire point of Tanuki Mario from Mario 3? Did Nintendo just think we liked this part because it was cute? It's f***ing adorable, but that's besides the point. It's really weird they make this whole game's identity surround a classic power-up returning when it can't even do the thing it was famous for doing. Other than the power-up, Mario 3D looked fantastic for a 3DS game. If you held it far away and squinted, it could probably be mistaken for Mario Galaxy. And the gameplay was interesting here. They were bringing in loads of elements from the 2D Mario game games and incorporating them in a 3D Mario for the first time ever. Ending the level with a flagpole, when you get hit you shrink down to small Mario, the way power-ups work, the stage timer, this was a very uniquely ununique Mario. There was stuff to discuss, but this trailer was far from great. I mean, they forgot to hold the run button in most of the footage, so this game looked slow. And pretty much everything here we've seen Mario do before. A few months later, the game's final title was revealed, and I don't know why they couldn't think of this sooner. I think they were panicking on what to call this thing. Super Mario 3D Land could be the title of any 3D Mario game ever released. This game's sequel, Super Mario 3D World, could have been called Super Mario 3D Land, and this one, Super Mario 3D World, and these titles are so close to Super Mario Land and Super Mario World that I constantly hear people mess up these games' titles. Super Mario Land 3D, Super Super Mario World 3D. Some people have just called this Super Mario Land and Super Mario World, but on top of that, some people have called this Super Mario Land and this Super Mario World. Well, after a few more trailers, some with really odd amounts of poppin, Super Mario 3D Land released on November 13th, 2011 here in North America to critical acclaim and PETA's fist. PETA is the organization to listen to. They love animals so much, they would kill one to prove how serious they are. They saw Nintendo was releasing a new Mario game featuring an animal suit as a power-up and decided to go for the angle of this. They even made an online Flash game about it all. Well, now I gotta listen to them. Obviously, this was done as a way to get attention. If you were somebody going online to discuss how absolutely ridiculous it is that PETA thinks Nintendo's promoting animal abuse, congratulations, you did exactly what PETA wanted you to do. And Mario 3 had a frog suit. Did anybody really think Nintendo was pressuring kids to think anything of that? Here's a gun. Kill a frog. Super Mario 3D Land was lauded as the killer app the 3DS needed. It actually used the glasses-free 3D effectively, with many saying it completely justified the gimmick, supplanting that it is 
in fact not just a gimmick and can be used to enhance gameplay. Because of that, and a very necessary price drop earlier in the year, this alongside the release of Mario Kart 7 kicked the 3DS in gear, and ever since it experienced a pretty sizable amount of success. Sure, it wasn't a runaway hit like the original Nintendo DS or Wii, but it did more than well enough to carry Nintendo throughout that generation. Mario 3D Land helped Nintendo sell a handheld that was truly its only hope during that era. The Wii was dying, the Wii U was about to release, so the Wii U was dying. The Nintendo 3DS was Nintendo's success story at the time, and without Super Mario 3D Land, it might have been a different story. So why does nobody give a shit about this game anymore? Super Mario 3D Land is the odd one out in the 3D Mario lineage. It's not a bad game, but most of the time people talk about 64, Sunshine, Galaxy 1 and 2, and then immediately jump over to 3D World or sometimes Odyssey. Many feel that with 3D Land's successor, there's not much reason to go back to it as 3D World is just better in most ways. If you played 3D World, you sort of already kind of played 3D Land. I mean, these are two separate games, though there's very little distinctive about this one other than it being five inches. I picked this one up after netting some Christmas money in late 2011. I played through it and loved every second, and then I played it again and then again, this time 100% completing the game with no deaths. And when I say no deaths, I mean every time I was about to die, I quit out of the game and re-entered until I beat it first try. Look at that, no deaths, I did that. All right, let's try out Super Mario 3D Land again. Never thought this would be the intro. Super Mario 3D Land starts out simple enough, just a small gameplay demo, but after a while, we enter the screen where we can control Mario and understand what makes the game tick. Now, of course, if you're not seeing this on a 3DS screen itself with the 3D turn on, you're missing out, buddy. See, cranking that 3D slider up, we get a sense of depth. Objects in the foreground are now obviously in the foreground, things in the background, yup, they're definitely back there. This demo screen features an optical illusion, where in 2D mode, you have more questions than answers. In 3D mode, you have more answers than questions. Moving in a specific location, Location shows how the illusion works if you're only playing in 2D, which many of us definitely did. With the 3D effect being really picky, you had to hold it in just the right spot to get the effect to work properly. In a couple 3DS models, excluding the 3D feature entirely, Mario 3D Land still works perfectly fine in 2D, but you'll always have that faint feeling you're missing something. Starting up a new file, Super Mario 3D Land has a tree and a lot of it. I guess this is giving story context as to why there are no tanuki leaves all over the place because that was my biggest concern when this game was announced. How is that Bowser's doing? It was a rainy night. It's like if I saw a fire. Oh, I know this exact arsonist that can tell by a signature flames. But breaking news, that isn't the only problem on the block. Bowser took peach and leaves. At least he left a note. That scared Mario so much he went to a world map. I love this little detail of Mario anxiously running in place. It only happens here in the beginning and that's why I like it. Hopping into world 1-1, I'm shocked. So, it's Mario. Duty Mario to be exact. Imagine a new Super Mario Brothers game where you can move in a 3D space. 3D Mario games up to this point were pretty different from 2D Marios in terms of the core design. You'd have multiple missions within a single level. Some games were more linear than others with specific ends to the levels, whereas some were more open-ended and about exploration. 3D Land is as linear as linear could be. You have a start to the level, get to the end of the level. There are no branching paths or much to do exploration wise. It's all about getting over this. That's not a bad thing. In fact, this does wonders for covering up that giant gash between 2D Mario and 3D Mario. These two things were pretty different, but 3D Land is if a 2D Mario was a 3D Mario. Most of the controls are just like they are in the 2D games, but we do have some extra moves from the 3D ones, like the long jump. But overall, 3D Land, in my opinion, has far more in common with 2D Mario than with 3D Mario. Again, not a bad thing, but it just makes it sort of underwhelming. Like, yup, it's 2D Mario in 3D. They did it. They did it well. Good for them. It's pretty cool considering and this is what Super Mario 64 was originally envisioned as. Tons of levels just like the 2D Mario games, a flagpole at the end, but it had to be reworked due to hardware limitations, so we got multiple missions to do in fewer, larger levels. In this way, 3D Land is like the game God never wanted us to see. But this time, we've got stereoscopic 3D without the need for glasses. I should have never gotten prescription lenses. This entire game was designed around the 3D, how the camera angles are fixed, the perspective of it all, the controls, everything was crafted to make it so the game was enhanced by the 3D effect. Now, jumping feels more precise. You know exactly where you're landing with that slider up. It's never 100% necessary, but I do feel playing the game in 2D, I miss my jumps a tad more than in 3D. You can also change whether or not the 3D pops out or sinks in by hitting up or down on the D-pad. Come on, 3D is way more pizzazzy when it's popping out. When it sinks in, I feel like I'm looking at a goldfish. So, well, yes, I agree the 3D does enhance the gameplay. It doesn't enhance it nearly as much as impressions back in 2011 made me believe. The way people were talking about this game sounded like every game from this point forward will have to be in glass free 3D, Super Mario 3D Land has started a revolution. Like, 
No. This is one of the few 3DS games that truly benefits from leaving that slider on. In most games, it's a nice effect, but not much more than that. In 3D Land, it's a nice effect that slightly benefits the player by turning it on, but not much more than that. These 3D illusion rooms appear every now and then, same idea as that demo screen. These are kind of cool. I guess they do the best job of immediately showcasing how 3D is beneficial, but I feel like these were designed in a way where they wanted to push a gimmick by creating a problem that wouldn't be there normally, and that problem is solved by said gimmick. Like, oh, you don't know where these coins are in perspective, do you? Crank that 3D slider up, see? Like, no, nobody thought, oh my god, they finally solved the coin problem. The rest of the game, these perspective issues aren't an issue. The 3D is sort of cool here, but it's a total and utter gimmick. It's like in Star Fox Zero, where you use the Wii U gamepad to aim, you have to look between the gamepad and the TV screen, and it's difficult to get used to, but people who did get used to it liked it a lot. They were like, aiming works really well this way. It also worked perfectly in Star Fox 64. They just created a problem with Star Fox Zero to then solve it with their shit gimmick and they didn't even solve it. Well, the 3D works pretty well in Mario 3D Land. It's just not that necessary. It does benefit you to leave it on, but I've played most of the game in 2D, no problem. May have missed a few jumps here and there, but I, I can always shrug it off. But that was the big thing everybody lauded about this game, the implementation of 3D. What else does it have going for it? Existence? This is one of the most basic Mario experiences you could ask for. At least with the new Super Mario Brothers games, I mean a basic Mario experience is what I expect. The title New Super Mario Brothers basically says that. But this is a 3D Mario game. To be fair, the title of Super Mario 3D Land kinda says basic Mario experience as well. However, when I lay out all the 3D Marios, this one has the least original about it, no doubt. Eight worlds, you go through each level, collect three star medals placed in each if you want. You need a certain amount to progress through the game, beat the boss at the end of the world, get a cute cutscene where Mario gets a letter showing the status of Peach, rinse and repeat. The level designs are good, but completely unmemorable. There isn't a single one where I get excited to replay it. Maybe the clock one, but that's it. Pretty much each of these levels has a theme we've seen done to death by Mario before. Oh shit, grass, snow, colors. Now at the very least, each world doesn't have a theme where every level in world one is grass themed, every level in world two is desert themed. No, the themes are completely random and I kind of like that. Variety is fun, it keeps things fresh. And again, the levels are well designed. They work great. They look wonderful on the 3DS. The entire game oozes quality. Like, this looks lovely. But it's all stuff we've seen before, and the stages are really short and really, really easy. There's an infinite one-up trick you can find in the second level. There's nothing wrong with easy games, but Mario 3D Land is so easy that it almost feels mindless. The levels just aren't too interesting from a design perspective. There's not really anywhere I get excited to play it. I'm just like, oh sweet, more shit for my thumb to do. Even the music is mostly just reused or remixed from previous games. The main power-up at play here is just taken from Mario 3 and you can't even fly! Sure, flying in these stages wouldn't work. So why bring back this power up? Why not create a brand new one? You can't even turn into a statue in its basic form. Now you can find a variant where you do turn into a statue by performing a ground pound. Thanks? The boomerang flower appears as a new power up and it's just a worse version of the fire flower. Thanks. If you die a lot, you get the invincibility leaf. It's the tanuki suit, but you're invincible. Thanks! And then if you die a lot a lot, you get the P-Wing where it just completes the level for you. Great feature. There is the propeller box, which isn't technically a power-up, more of a box you can wear. It's pretty much the propeller suit from New Super Mario Bros. Wii, moving on. I mean, I always just want the Tanuki suit 100%. It's the best power-up in this game. But again, you bring back this power-up to just gut it of what made it great in the first place. At least there are a decent amount of new enemies, like Tail Bowser, that's his name. Many enemies now have Tanuki tails. Again, I think Nintendo got the wrong idea as to what we liked about the Tanuki suit. I looked quality, but where's the tail? I've matured since. Nintendo has thrown this tail on so many things in the Mario universe around this time. Like, oh, well, people love the Tanuki suit. For the tail! But we do get these guys, this guy, those guys. There's some fun new designs in here. But they also put a tail on a block. That's a new enemy. Look at this list of characters. Pump the brakes! There are these cutouts of enemies that are supposed to trick you. It's an illusion where you can tell what's a real enemy and what's a fake enemy if you have the 3D on. And I never mistook a cutout of an enemy for a real enemy. I, I don't know who they were fooling here. We have toad houses to visit every now and then where they give us some power-ups. Honestly, what I like about these is the camera angle when entering the house. This feels like a regular 3D Mario game. And this whole thing just feels cool to run around. It reminds me of the camera angles from the original screenshots at GDC. Like these make the game look way more involved than it turned out to be. The fixed camera angle works really well here, but makes the game feel so sterile. Like, yup. This is all there is to see. There are these mystery rooms you can enter on the world map or in a level itself where you get this tiny challenge you have to complete under a time limit. 
fine. Like, most of these challenges are crazy easy, so they're not the most engaging in the world. Boss fights! They brought back Boom Boom from Mario 3 alongside his brand new female counterpart, Pom Pom, but they're the only bosses besides Bowser, so you refight these guys a couple times alongside refighting Bowser a couple times. At least the final Bowser fight is pretty neat. It's this giant crumbling landscape, and he throws barrels like Donkey Kong. This is regular Bowser we're talking here, not Tail Bowser. And when those credits finally roll after three hours of playing from start to finish, Jesus Christ, this was a short and easy game. It's time to reflect on what I just played. It was okay. But then something magical happens. The game doubles in length. We get eight special worlds. I, I think that's just awesome. Many Mario games only give you a couple of these, but Mario 3D Land effectively gives you two times the stages. That's so cool. This is where we get the statue leaf. The poison mushroom makes an appearance every now and then. These are remixed stages. Levels from the regular eight worlds revamped to be a bit harder. Some of them are pretty lazy. They just kind of barf cosmic clones in them where they mimic your every move and touching them hurts you. But hey, you unlock Luigi as a playable character after beating the first special world. He doesn't turn into Tanuki Luigi. He turns into Kitsune. Luigi because Luigi can't be a Tanuki. Are you f***ing serious? And then beating every stage as Mario and Luigi, collecting every star medal and getting to the top of every flagpole unlocks one final, brutally difficult, tough as nails level I beat it in one try. See, Super Mario 3D Land's ideal of brutally difficult is on par with a CNC. Oh, that is Super Mario 3D Land, or as many others call it, Mario Land Super 3D. I know I just dogged on this game, but I loved this thing. I replayed it constantly. It was always sort of my safe bet game. If I didn't know what to play, but I knew for a fact I wouldn't be starting Max Payne 3, I would just replay Mario 3D Land again. This is a good game, but critically looking at it right now, it's really basic. I feel like I've become less accepting of the status quo for a Mario game, which this is very much that. It for sure gave a massive push to the 3DS, not only showing how 3D can enhance a game, but also using the gyroscope. Save the 3DS. Mario 3D Land was kind of my junk food game. There wasn't a ton of substance, but it was a great time killer. The stages being so quick and easy made them perfect for a handheld. And while the game itself doesn't have a lot of personality to truly make it stick out compared to the other 3D Marios, what it did well, it did well. So I think that answers the question, why isn't this talked about as much? There's not much to say about it. It's a new Super Mario Brothers game in 3D. It honestly makes more sense to talk about 3D Land alongside new Super Mario Brothers than Super Mario Sunshine. Oh my god, I said something wild, didn't I? I should shield my eyes from such statements. I didn't have sunglasses, so I spray painted my lenses black. Oh my god. A room! I don't know why, but I feel like giving Super Mario 3D World a critical look. Hey y'all, Scott here, and I just had the craziest dream. I was a virgin talking about Mario, which is ridiculous because I'm a virgin talking about Mario again. Oh, so many games I can talk about, so many new experiences to have. How about this one? Even when I'm convicted, I still talk about this game. Super Mario 3D World was a game I talked about during the dawn of my Peach Fuzz era. We're still in it. But I feel like it's necessary to give this game more attention. I want to give Mario 3D World another look, Mom. On top of a few other things I've talked about in the past, I feel like I can fully commit to some topics that I've merely just brushed upon before. So let's rip the band-aid off and dive back into Super Mario 3D World. A collection of words that language was always leading to. Mario games used to really mean something when a new one came out, Congress shut down. Each one was a revolution in its own right without totally invalidating the previous title. The people didn't stop playing Mario 1 when Mario 2, 3, and World came out. Just pure, simple fun. Get to the end of the stage by avoiding the obstacles. At its core, that's what 2D Mario was all about. But then Super Mario 64 squirted onto store shelves and it changed everything. Revolutionizing 3D gaming, this set the standard for not only future Mario games, but video games as a whole. Manhunt has somebody to thank. These wide open areas to explore with a huge moveset at your disposal led to one of the most memorable gaming experiences of all time. Everybody remembers their first romp through the castle grounds and walking into the castle themselves, and jumping into a painting and collecting their first star. The game fundamentally had a mission structure. Due to hardware limitations, they couldn't fit 90 plus levels in here like with Super Mario World, they had to craft just a handful of 
large open stages that housed various different missions within them, which this is the format 3D Mario rolled with. At the end of the day, 2D and 3D Mario were two vastly different things, 2D being about just ending it all right here, and 3D being about exploration. There wasn't always an end to the course, most levels were open-ended, they were designed with numerous end goals in mind, with missions and different ways to tackle problems, more puzzles, more solutions. Still haven't graduated. Super Mario 64 was a big deal, but it pretty much killed off 2D Mario for a while there. The Wario Land series on handhelds was sort of the replacement at the time, with the only 2D Mario platformers being remakes or re-releases, because 64's direct follow-up, Super Mario Sunshine, pushed the series further in the direction 64 initiated. Its main innovation was plagiarism. Aquafina, call your lawyers. Sunshine was a bit more love it or hate it for some. Wow, you hate water? Then what, you hate 70% of your body? Yeah. Nah, it mainly boiled down to the difficulty, collectibles, level design, some didn't like the new flood pack for spraying and hovering with water. Why won't you play Mario Sunshine? I'm more of a Pepsi guy. But it's a great game overall, may not have been anything groundbreaking, but this format for 3D Mario was still doing wonders. But I think Nintendo realized Sunshine in 64 lost a few people in the transition from 2D to 3D. It truly sets us apart from the 40 year olds. So in 2006, on the Nintendo DS, we got New Super Mario Brothers, a complete return to form, showing how the 3D games just can't replace the 2D ones. They were two different things. And when sales came in, that was more obvious than anything. The 2D games had a far wider appeal. They were so easy to understand. Anybody could pick them up and play them. They needed to come back. Though 3D Mario was still alive and well, even if it was starting to change. A year later in 2007, Super Mario Galaxy released. With everything feeling so grand and epic, this was the magnum opus for 3D Mario, even if it was quite a bit different from previous titles. You're still collecting stars with missions to tackle, but the courses are much more linear. You don't fall into a world with Nintendo saying, I don't know. Most Galaxy levels really funnel you in the direction to go, which isn't a bad thing, it's just different. If anything, it felt like a throwback to how 2D Mario was designed, but still feeling like 3D Mario. It was this amazing amazing inbred cousin. Even if you preferred how 64 and Sunshine worked, Galaxy was so damn cool. Like, I'm wearing overalls in space, go f yourself. But after Galaxy, Mario games kept leaning more and more into the style, until it got to the point where 64 and Sunshine's influence on the series was barely recognizable. New Super Mario Bros. Wii, just another new Super Mario Bros. game, now with a multiplayer mode. Super Mario Galaxy 2, another phenomenal game, but it was even more linear than Galaxy 1. These stages truly feel like 2D Mario levels in 3D, which is exactly what the next game went for, Super Mario 3D Land. The first original 3D Mario game on a handheld was structured exactly like a 2D Mario game. I'd say it's more 2D Mario than 3D, which is perfect for the handheld form factor of the Nintendo 3DS. Play a few levels, get the three star medals hidden throughout, throw the system in the back seat. All of these games and the direction Nintendo was heading with Mario it made sense and felt justified, but a year later, Nintendo released two new Super Mario Bros. games within months of each other. New Super Mario Bros. 2 on the 3DS and New Super Mario Bros. U on Wii U. This was when I think everybody had enough. New Super Mario Bros. was great. I mean, I think the four stages of grief are awesome. But each one was just a new Super Mario Brothers for that console. They didn't stick out. Each game just felt like a variation of the other. And this iterative nature of Mario at the time caused everybody to look back at the past few years asking, what are we doing here? New Super Mario Brothers had infected the entire Mario series. The 3D games were starting to feel more and more like the 2D ones, and we were getting less unique characters and art styles. It was all becoming just basic generic Mario. These games were all blending in with each other. We weren't getting these massive 3D worlds with cool new characters and settings anymore, and the Mario franchise was becoming less and less interesting because of it. New Super Mario Brothers followed this very clean, basic template. They didn't really want to take things in a new direction or introduce new types of worlds or enemies. It was always about bringing back fan favorite elements from Super Mario Brothers 3 and World and keeping the art style corporate friendly. I'd invest in that. So while these games were all at the very least good, they were too derivative of previous works to really stand out. There's a reason to play Mario 3 instead of World. There's pretty much no reason to play New Mario 2 instead of U. And with New Super Mario Brothers U launching with the brand new Wii U console, it didn't really take advantage of its unique features. Unless you count changing the fucking world as one. Can't do that in The Last of Us. Having a Mario game alongside a console launch was nice. 
That's the best thing I can say about this game. But we were all waiting for that new 3D Mario experience for the system. 64, Sunshine, Galaxy, even 3D Land all took advantage of their respective consoles. They showed what they were capable of. 3D Land really validated the Nintendo 3DS's 3D display. God only knows what they could do with the Wii U gamepad. Seriously, only God knows, nobody else does. The gamepad was famous for not having a purpose, so I think we were all looking towards a 3D Mario for Wii U to show us why? And we didn't have to wait long to hear about it, as on January 23rd, 2013, a Wii U Direct occurred with then Nintendo president Satoru Iwata basically telling Wii U owners to dear god like your systems. Even if they didn't have anything to show, Nintendo made it clear that a new 3D Mario done by the Galaxy and 3D Land team was in development for Wii U and would be shown and playable at E3 2013. My god, this game could be called anything. Super Mario Universe? Super Mario Universe again? The main idea I saw thrown around was a sequel to the Galaxy series, subtitled Universe, playing off the Wii U name because honestly, there weren't a ton of other options. Speculation ran wild up until E3 that June. Expectations were high and my virginity was nearing tornado siren levels. The E3 2013 Nintendo Direct started and shortly after, Iwata told us to take a look. Yes! No! The title revealed was Super Mario 3D World, a sequel to Super Mario 3D Land on the 3DS. Nintendo likes to say they put smiles on their fans' faces. They sure do. Honestly, I didn't see a ton of people excited, or if they were, it felt like they were going, okay, okay, new Mario game. Needed that. I don't think anybody was beyond disgusted. I just felt the entire world during this announcement go, Huh. What made 3D Land so great was its use of the 3DS hardware. It was designed for that handheld. So taking that and putting a sequel with the exact same structure on Wii U, it was underwhelming. There's no other way to put it. It didn't look bad, but it screamed, just another Mario game. And that was my biggest issue with it. It had that plastic basic art style that the new Super Mario Brothers games had. And while it was running in HD, Galaxy and the Wii still looked better. It had a superior art style and lighting. Just comparing the lava in the scene from the trailer to that game shows the problem here. There was no fanfare to this announcement. Even the trailer felt like it didn't care. This wasn't a big moment. Nintendo wasn't treating this like Mario's next big step. This felt like a press release made a trailer. Mario's in 3D on the Wii U. They were the first ones brave enough to do it. The trailer itself, is fine, it just came out at a bad time. There was legitimate Mario fatigue. So many games that felt too similar to each other, all releasing back to back within the last four years. This new Mario game needed to be on the same level as Mario Galaxy in terms of a big idea that wowed. But the trailer just showed green plains, ice world, lava, some new enemies here and there, but is that really enough to make the game stand out? We were getting to the point where seeing mice got us excited, like, Wow, that's new! Like, do something original for once. Make the pipes clear, huh? What? They did show off some more unique elements, like the cat suit, the game's new power-up, the Wii U gamepad functionality, letting you rub gophers. Like, I can't already do that. Multiple playable characters, Luigi, Peach, Toad, all with unique characteristics based on their appearances in Super Mario Bros. 2, and you can play four-player multiplayer with them. An awesome addition, being the first mainline 3D Mario game with four-player co-op, but... It's already so similar to the new Super Mario Brothers games, and those already had multiplayer. If anything, this didn't help differentiate the game. This just brought 3D Mario that much closer to new Super Mario Brothers. 3D World was warmly received. The people who got to demo the game said it was a ton of fun, but these are gaming journalists we're talking about here. Do they know how to have fun? I didn't hate what I was seeing. It was just hard to get excited when it felt like Nintendo wasn't even excited. This wasn't the game they needed at the time. It felt like a very ho-hum announcement. They weren't immensely proud or confident. It was just a new Mario game. Bye. You can tell many fans were upset that 3D World wasn't a regular 3D Mario due to them releasing a YouTube video during E3 showing how the game does in fact have camera control. Oh, come on, man. That's a technicality. This game just didn't really do much for me initially when it was revealed. I mean, I was obviously going to play it. I mean... Look at me. But it felt like a 3D Mario that was created just to put out something quickly on Wii U, rather than something created out of a lust to do something creative and new with Mario. It's like they just took what they did with 3D Land and just rolled with it. It was the latest 3D Mario game they made, so it was probably the easiest to do a new 3D Mario in that style. You just take 3D Land, spruce it up in HD, put it on the Wii U, boom. That's how game development works. Those lazy swine and Nintendo thought they could just make a video game when I wanted a video game in space. But it turns out all of life's problems can be and will be solved on October 1st, 2013.
The second trailer for the game kicked off an October Nintendo Direct with this one blowing everybody away. While it may not live up to previous 3D titles, at the very least, 3D World looked like an actual video game instead of the product of Nintendo hitting Make Mario on the keyboard. So much personality, big band jazz music played against cutscenes, boss fights, new power-ups, crazy level design, this isn't just a 3D new Super Mario Brothers game. It showed a lot of that creativity and passion we came to expect from a big 3D Mario like this. It's just in a more simplified form now. All edited incredibly well into the trailer too. It's pretty clear why this trailer got everybody excited, and this one started a revolution. Back at E3 2013, the game was initially set for a December 2013 launch, which was bizarre for a Mario title. The month of Christ! That's a Xenoblade thing. They ended up swapping the initial release months with Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, finally confirming a November 22nd, 2013 release date, alongside Mario & Luigi Wii remotes coinciding with the release month. Nintendo also uploaded an overview trailer for the game a few weeks later, but just called at the October trailer? Then what the hell was this? I guess Nintendo was really worried that people didn't know Motley Boss Blob was in the game, so they released another trailer a week before release, pretty much spoiling any secrets the title had to offer. I mean, that's cool, but I doubt they would actually have Motley Boss Blob in it. Those tricky bitches! The trailer showed off almost all major secret unlockables, like, why? I guess because 3D World had a ton of competition on release day. Not only was Nintendo releasing it alongside The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds on 3DS, not only was it launching the same day as the Xbox One and its launch games, but it was releasing the same day as Mario Party Island Tour. And the Xbox One never recovered. 3D World was met with critical acclaim across the board, with many considering it the highlight of all the November 22nd releases. 10 out of 10s were thrown around, calling it the reason to buy a Wii U. Must have been a 10 out of 10 minus. Nintendo really pushed the game, making YouTube videos where they didn't know how to capture their own gameplay. They were serious. Commercials, which just highlighted the problem with Nintendo ads during the Wii U era. Lights, a child on the couch, playing Wii U, game on the screen. Game world expands to living room. Mom satisfied, dad's like, whoa! Narrator tries to make anything sound appealing to your parents. Clear pipes are in this family fun Mario 3D Wii U only for the Wii U scene. I played this game at launch and was so excited to do so. I followed everything up until the game's release and it all looked like so much crazy fun and I played through the whole thing, completed as much as I possibly could, and was satisfied knowing that this was an excellent Mario game. Though as time went on, I became much more critical of the game, considering I didn't remember a ton of it, it wasn't that memorable. So I decided to take a critical second look at it, and now I'm going to take a critical third look at it, because I need to up my credit score. You'll be amazed what links with that. Here it is, Super Mario 3D World. This title is horrible. It's bad enough the logo is an exact copy of 3D Lands, but with a cattail photoshopped on, but I've heard so many people get this name wrong, getting it confused with 3D Land in the original Mario World. It makes me so angry. Why does the background look like a transparent PNG? Well, the box art is very appealing, I'll give it that, but to the normal bystander, what makes this Mario game different from this one, you know? Like Galaxy, he's in space. Sunshine, water pack. This one, it's just the Mario game having a ball. I mean, I guess there's two of them and 50% of the room is a cat. I don't know, it's just fun Mario adventure. That's what this says, which is exactly what this says. And this says, yeah, this was back whenever anybody would see the Nintendo Network logo on a Wii U box, they shit their pants. I cover it up for that reason. When this box art came out, many assumed this meant online multiplayer. In reality, it's just me for support. What a cock to you. Should have included the text, it's not what you think. The back of the box has to specify anything new here, which almost makes it sound like this is a re-release of an old game with new content. We'll get to that. So many parallels between this and Mario 3D Land. The box design, the game disc and card follow the same format. Even the manual takes design cues from 3D Land. Except the spine, that takes cues from Mario Galaxy 2. I wish my spine did. Well, let's give this game a third chance. I thought it was excellent the first time, just good the second time, so it better be fucking atrocious this time or I'm pissed. expected Mario to say that. Super Mario 3D World kicks things off with a Greek tragedy. The king's all here during fireworks and they notice a pipe! Clear pipe. This isn't the Mario I know! They fix it and out pops a Sprixy princess, a fairy that is begging for help. Bowser captured the other ones! This is a direct reference to those 2D art pieces shown before each world in Super Mario 3D Land, but this is the only time it ever happens in this game, which is just kind of strange. It is I, a picky bitch! Bowser squirts out of the pipe, and I have to say, I love the more classic cartoony style 3D World goes for. Bowser's animations here and how Mario and Luigi fix the clear pipe feels straight out of a Saturday morning cartoon. So, Bowser's kidnapping fairies now. 
Am I really gonna complain about that hobby? Look at my wall. The gang falls in the pipe and into the Sprixy Kingdom. Could you tell? That's why the box art refers to this as a whole new world. This isn't the Mushroom Kingdom, it's the Sprixy Kingdom, which I feel like is a huge missed opportunity. At no point in this game does it feel like this isn't the Mushroom Kingdom, making it a big deal that we're not in the Mushroom Kingdom anymore. I feel like they could have run with the idea that we're in a completely different area now by introducing strange new environments. It's a wonderful little detail how the characters have this urgency right after the opening cutscene on the world map. They did that in 3D land, but now the world map is its own thing. You can roam around it like a mini level. It's incredibly limited though. You can jump and sort of run, but that's about it. There are a few coins scattered throughout and very minor secrets to uncover, but this feels like they wanted to give the game something that felt like a hub world, like Peach's Castle or the Comet Observatory, and I can see the potential in this world map style. It's genuinely really intuitive, and the fact they hide a few small little secrets here and there shows that it could be so much more. But that's all it does. It just makes me think this could be so much more. Like imagine if you had the full moveset you had in the game's actual levels, imagine if there were small platforming challenges or even more secrets to find. No, it's basically a new Super Mario Brothers map that you can freely walk around. Cool that we have that ability, but it just makes me wish they did more with it. On to the first stage. Shocking. Green Plains, we have some control of Mario. Your movement is locked to eight directions only, which is less than 3D lands, which still only had 12 directions you could point Mario in. It just snaps you into the rough area you're pointing in, which isn't a huge deal. It isn't like the Link's Awakening remake where Link just juts from direction to direction. Nah, there's some animation to make it look really smooth, but it still likes the precision you got in previous games. This was because 3D World was designed with the lowest common denominator in mind, the Wii Remote on its side. The game supports a ton of control schemes. The Wii U Gamepad, Pro Controller, Wii Remote and Nunchuck, the Wii Classic Controller and Classic Controller Pro, or just the Wii Remote on its side. This is disgusting. Ever try to play a 3D game with a Wii Remote on its side? Ever kill a ghost? To make for an even playing field, even if you have a controller with a full analog stick, you still get that eight-way movement, which again, isn't a big deal. I don't really care, it's just kind of an odd quirk of the game. If anything, the eight-way movement was a smart move considering how the rest of the game is designed. Jumping on a Goomba, if you had 360 directions to jump in, it's more likely you could miss. Here, with how it's basically a 2D game in 3D, I think the limited directions make sense. Mario retains a lot of the classic 3D moves he's had throughout the years. Long jump, side somersault, wall jump, ground pound, roll, it all feels perfectly fine, but you still have to hold the run button, which is taken from the 2D games in 3D land. 3D World has this weird dash mechanic where you hold the run button and after a few seconds of running you get this burst of speed and many times I find myself running in circles so I don't trigger the burst when I don't want to. You get this new power jump by ground pounding into a jump. You can spin and jump like in Mario Sunshine. The game overall controls great. It's a Mario game. I think they're legally supposed to. It just has a few little things that are a 3D world only shtick, but if you're not feeling one character, you have an endless supply of others to try. I never got to that page in the dictionary. Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad, each playable in any level, each with their own characteristics. Mario is the all-around bag of wonder bread. Luigi is slippery but jumps higher, Peach is slow but hovers in the air, and Toad is fast but just can't get it up. Having all these characters is great, and with Peach playable here, it forces the story to be at least a little different from the norm. I've personally always been just run-of-the-mill Mario. I like knowing what I'm getting into. Playing as Luigi, I'm gonna have to speak to an attorney. Playing as Peach is cheating. Yeah, no, where am I more monogamous in Mario 3D World? And Toad, I mean, yeah, he's fast, good for him, he's great for when you just wanna end it all. I think this character lineup is fantastic, though. Far better than the new Super Mario Bros. multiplayer lineup consisting of that, this, and Yellow Toad. And just the fact they all have unique attributes is the cherry on top. I mean, I may prefer Mario, but if you can play as one character well, you're bound to at the very least be decent at the rest, and it shakes things up. The characters' abilities are really well-rounded, though I do wish they were implemented into the level design at some points. A handful of stages include these character-specific switches, where if you want one of the collectibles, you have to hit the switch as that character. I don't know, I just feel like this is a little lame. It's not fun, I don't throw a party when I find the Switch as a specific character. All this does is prolong the game time for a sort of dumb reason as I have to exit the level, select the character I need, hit the Switch, and then complete the level of said character. I would have preferred instead of a basic Switch, a small mini challenge would be there in which a specific character would excel at, like a crumbling bridge Toad could zoom past or high platforms only Luigi could reach. Because the reason you'd implement these Switches is to ensure the players at the very least try different characters, but if you're gonna do that, show why they'd 
want to try those different characters by showcasing their abilities. It's also a bit annoying how you can't switch characters after you die before any single stage begins. You have an audible countdown asking, are you sure about this? And you can pick your character, randomize it, that's nice, but after I die, I would have liked if during the screen showing your life counter going down, you had the same character select pop up. I mean, if I'm playing the game for the first time, how would I know which character would be best for the stage I'm about to play? If I die, there's a good chance I want to swap characters to better fit the level, which is something at the very least you could do after a game over in Super Mario Bros. 2. But something Super Mario Bros. 2 didn't have was multiplayer, which is 3D World's biggest focus. The first multiplayer 3D Mario adventure, because Galaxy 1 and 2 only gave birth to single and a half player. Oh wow, you're pregnant with twins? Kinda. 3D World is four player multiplayer where each player has equal footing. You're all playing characters with the same worth in Toad and you're all getting to the flagpole at the end. The idea of a 3D Mario with multiplayer like this harkens back to the rumblings of two player support in Mario 64 and its canceled sequel. Running around as both Mario and Luigi in a 3D environment was something everybody who played a 3D Mario thought of and at E3 2009, Nintendo announced they were taking that step. But we admit we haven't quite figured out how to move him into a fourth dimension. But that number, four, that's the key to Mario's next surprise. I was f***ing befuddled when they announced that. Like, of course the Wii Play guys found the fourth dimension. Now they announced four-player multiplayer and new Super Mario Bros. Wii, which was so exciting at the time. But in practice, I found it more frustrating than fun. You'd always run into each other, so a 3D Mario with multiplayer felt like this idea was finally fully realized. You just have more space in 3D and more opportunities for creatively horrendous things to occur. Of course, I don't think the casual audience really understood that. I think this and this both look the exact same to them. They don't really see the value in a multiplayer Mario in a 3D space compared to a 2D one, like this commercial sells it. But for plastic gropers like us, this is easily the best multiplayer Mario platformer. The 3D space gives each player far more room to do their thing, but you can still cause chaos if you're from that side of history. The thing is though, the multiplayer is fun. It's fun to be able to play a whole ass Mario game with eight hands, but I wish it was all more fleshed out. Basically the multiplayer is just play the game with others. There's no extra modes or anything focused on it. The core game alone is fun enough with friends, but it's the most fun when you're going through the game on a new save file. Because if I wanna out of nowhere just play 3D World with some friends and play a later level, I have to hop into a save file that's already beaten and with all the collectibles already nabbed. You still get points for grabbing them, but with them being literally already obtained and transparent, it just makes them less enticing. The level's been beaten already, why are we going through it again? And then afterwards, just run around the world map and try to find another stage to play just for the sake of playing a stage. It's not that bad, I mean, at the end of the day, why are you playing video games to do something fun? Just because these stages are already beaten, it doesn't really matter because it's just about having fun with friends. But half of the fun of Mario 3D World's multiplayer is that you're going through the game completing it together. It makes it when you miss a collectible, when you miss the top of the flagpole, when you lose all those lives more engaging. So to get that experience with this game, you can't can't go to a multiplayer free play mode or something. You pretty much always have to start a new save file. And there's only so many times you can do that until it gets ridiculous. There's this mechanic that tallies up the point total of each player at the end, which I think is fantastic. 2D Mario games have had a point system forever and it's pretty much never amounted to anything. It's a holdover from arcade games. And honestly, by Mario 3, they should have axed it. But 3D World uses it for multiplayer and it's literally just to spark fights amongst players. All you get for winning a stage is a useless crown in the next one and you can lose it others can steal it, it may seem lame to not have a legitimate reward for winning, but it's a smart move on the developer's part. It turns 3D World into a much more human-centered multiplayer game. They know how people act, and it just makes the whole experience that much more fun and hilarious that everybody's fighting over a crown that amounts to nothing. They should write a book about war. So I love the points mechanic. I love multiplayer in this game. Two players if you just want to get stuff done, three to four if you want to watch the world burn, but I just wanted more options when it comes to multiplayer. I would have liked a coin battle mode where it gives you a couple of stages where you and friends fight for the most coins, or just a free-for-all one where they give you a string of five levels where the collectibles are still glowing in there, and maybe at the end you fight a boss and they total up the points for the entirety of the stages all together. In fact, that would have been a really cool touch after you beat 3D World in multiplayer to have it tally up all the scores from all the levels to see who won everything. Uh, that would require literally everybody to play every stage together with no breaks or anything, but uh, that would have been cool. They could have at the very least done that at the end of each world. But speaking of which, the game is separated via eight worlds with four special worlds after beating the main game. Seven Sprixy princesses are at the end of the first seven worlds awaiting their rescue. They all have different hairstyles. Seven, seven, eight, four, two, eight, five. Each map has a certain theme, but the levels inside don't follow it mostly. Usually the first few stages correlate with the map theme, but mostly you're getting a dentist appointment. I don't know what 
what I'm gonna get. You have scoliosis. Oh, it's either really that bad. I mean, that keeps the game crazy fresh, as you have no idea what stage you're getting next, but it does make the game feel less like a world. At the end of the day, it just feels like a string of random good Mario stages. Nothing wrong with that. I think that strengthens the game overall. It's just one idea for one level, and then a completely different one the next. I don't care for desert levels a ton, but in World 2 that's themed around a desert, it doesn't matter. There's only one desert stage. But I think this decision, while good, does add to making 3D World's actual levels a bit forgettable. Each one is so short, they're all about getting to the end and reaching the flagpole, just like Mario 3D Land and the entire new Super Mario Brothers series. It's a tried and true formula that is designed perfectly here. But that doesn't mean it leaves much of an impact on me. On top of that, while the control is all fine and good, this game has some pretty wonky moments where you just don't know where you're jumping. 3D World at its core is still 3D Land, and that game was tailor-made with the 3DS in mind. That's why it had the camera angles it did to emphasize the 3D effect. That display made precise jumps easier to perform. 3D World doesn't really do a lot to change this. It still feels like it was designed with a stereoscopic 3D display in mind, and that kind of hurts it a bit. Numerous times, I'll jump for a platform and fall to my death because I thought I was lined up with it, and the camera's so fixed that you can't really do a ton about it. You can move to the left, the right, it's like I'm really there. The camera features are limited, so much that I forgot they're even a thing. Especially the gyro camera, who used that? Though the camera angle isn't the biggest issue, as it's always at the ideal spot at a fixed angle, and the depth perception isn't a huge problem as well, it's just obvious this game's core was designed with a different system in mind. And that extends to the courses themselves, which feel like expanded 3D land levels. They're bigger in scope and feel less claustrophobic, but they follow the same formula. It's the same as 3D land, though a bit spruced up. The levels are all basically obstacle courses, and the art design really sells that concept. It's like everything's from the show Wipeout. It all looks artificial, which I don't know why. All the characters have this plastic shine to them. The grass looks like AstroTurf. The level design itself looks like a collection of blocks put in a very well thought out way. But at the end of the day, it's still just a collection of blocks. These stages all take place in the sky on floating platforms. The world map shows them as these little diorama looking things. And when you think of it from that perspective, the design makes a lot more sense. But why wouldn't they go all the way with it? Nintendo loves experimenting with arts and crafts art styles. And that trend started around this time. So if they wanted 3D World to look like a diorama, why not go all the way with it? If you want everything to look artificial, give it a look like Yoshi's Crafted World or something. Instead, it's this weird balance between incredibly artificial and normal looking Mario game. That's not to say the game looks bad. I mean, it looks disgusting. Disgustingly clean. Everything in this game feels fully crafted to not show any imperfections. You can't see any jagged polygons or anything. It's all as smooth as can be. Like a cigarette. In more ways than one. 3D World may be very slick looking, but it doesn't really wow me, you know? Like, you can draw a perfect circle. There's not much detail, but it's the best damn circle around. The guy next to you may draw an imperfect circle with some rough wavy lines, but they put all this detail around it. Like, yeah, that other one's perfectly round, but this one's more fun to look at. 3D World feels like it was engineered to be as inoffensive to look at as possible, but because of that, it's not that interesting to look at. Like this bridge. Who cares? Why not have more detail, some more NPCs, more backgrounds, something like this stage that's supposed to be an homage to Super Mario Kart. The background's mostly just an empty void. Why not add stuff like a stadium or more detail? Like the original Super Nintendo course has more detail in the background. But this is all probably so then 3D World runs flawlessly at 60 frames per second. The simplistic art design is probably here to keep the game running perfectly with such high polygonal 3D models. But just comparing it to Mario Galaxy, a game that also ran perfectly, this game just has so much more oomph to the art design, albeit running on less demanding hardware, but just comparing these two, even though 3D World has a superior resolution, Galaxy just looks better. To me, 3D World looks too basic most of the time. There are loads of moments it shines, like the water here. Oh, don't mind Nintendo, they made the greatest looking water in a video game as the background for the Bowser in a car level. The game genuinely looks really good. All the colors pop and many times the art design comes fully together. It just feels like it's made for specific lighting, specific styles, specific instances, because when you take this art style out of its comfort zone, you get the stage sprawling savanna. The lighting here just really highlights how unpleasant the characters look with this plastic feel. And then you get to this segment where the camera goes behind the character. Really, the only time in the game when it does this, it's a cool nod to the more open 3D Mario games. 
But then you see this disgusting level of popping, and it's not even like they're trying to hide it. It shows much of this game was designed with the fixed camera in mind. 3D World is supposed to be consumed in a very specific way, and that's not a bad thing, but I see these little glimpses of moments where it feels like the developers wanted to make a grander adventure, but had to reel things back due to how limiting the 3D World template is. But they really took those limitations and made a damn good game out of them. What the hell, after all that, I like this game? The cousin you love the most is the one you're most critical of. Super Mario 3D World has some of the most refined level design of any Mario game. Everything is meticulously placed in such an intelligent way to make for well thought out and fun courses. But that's all they are, and I'm sick of it! My problems come in with the sheer impact of them. There aren't really any levels in this game where I go, damn, after beating them. It's always, uh, what a nice level that was, which is what I thought was Super Mario 3D Land, and to a much lesser extent, the new Super Mario Brothers series. I mean, for those games, I forget their level designs for breakfast. 3D World stages are so quick and to the point, and I remember a chunk of them, but most of them are fun in the moment, and then I move on with my life. Like, I can't think of a single bad one, but who goes off? Oh, yeah, the ant stage. It's good platforming, but that's all it really is. It doesn't leave much of an impression on me other than, this is fun. Though that does make this probably the most consistently good Mario adventure. Even the best Mario games have stages I just don't really want to play sometimes. This one, not so much. I don't leap out of my seat excited for most levels, but I'm more than happy to play them, which is more than what I can say about some of the other games. Even Galaxy, my favorite game of all time, has a few iffy ones in there. Each level is fairly short and encompasses a unique gimmick to call its own, but one of the defining ones across the whole game is clear pipe. It was implemented because the developers wondered what Mario looked like while inside the pipes. These are interesting ways of traversal. You're constantly moving and can only change your direction when you get to a fork in the road. They do a few fun things with them, but what 3D World usually does is introduce a thing, use that thing, and then discard that thing before it gets stale, or in some cases, reach its full of potential. When each level has its own gimmick, whether it's really focusing on clear pipes, or soccer ball bombs, silhouettes, the giant rideable dinosaur plessy, a limited time limit, switchboard, circus elements, it's really fun and keeps things fresh though it makes me wish these elements were expanded upon. They could have done so much more with all of these awesome ideas, but they didn't in exchange for more ideas, which is great because that means no idea necessarily overstays its welcome. It just leaves me wanting more, which is probably the preferred outcome. But even the best stages here don't really give me the same feeling the best stages of other Mario games did. These are perfectly designed levels that are loads of fun to play through. There's literally nothing wrong with their layouts, and it's a flawless game to use as an example for game design. But be honest, just looking at both of these, what would you remember more? I've said it before, but each level's short length could have been expanded upon. Like combining all three of the Grassy Plains areas to make one giant area would have made the whole Grassy Plains segment more memorable. Most stages have three green stars to find and a stamp, which are the main collectibles. Green stars are just star coins or star medals from New Super Mario Brothers or Super Mario 3D Land. It's just find all three hidden in the stage and stamps they're just a fourth green star. Another collectible with this one giving you black and white pieces of art which you were able to use in Miiverse posts on Wii U. You know, originally you would see posts after beating level and on the world map, while also seeing ghost me's appear in stages you've already beaten, showing people from around the world's playthrough of the level. The ghost me's feature was kinda cool, but it was sorta Nintendo's way of saying, here's online multiplayer in the smallest of fonts. But the green stars are really fun to collect because many are well hidden or tricky to get to. I found the comet medals in Mario Galaxy 2 to never be hard to nab, they were pretty much always directly obtainable. I think the green stars strike a great difficulty balance. Most of them are easy to find but hard to grab, or hard to find but easy to grab. I just find them being green stars to be odd. Uh, green stars mainly appeared in Galaxy 2 as bonus stars after you completed the main game. Here, they're just star metal replacements, and I feel like they did that to make the game have more in common with the likes of Mario Galaxy. What are you talking about? You're still collecting the stars and you need them to progress sometimes, just like in the real 3D Mario games. God. Damn, Nintendo, you know exactly how to shut my stupid fucking mouth. You have a few diversions here and there in the form of the mystery box and Captain Toad stages on the world map. These are easy ways to get a bunch of green stars. The mystery box stages involve a gauntlet of multiple challenges in a row. You have to kill all the enemies or complete the puzzle within 10 seconds and move right on to the next one. And you have to do it all in one go to complete the stage. Once again, the concept of these were taken from 3D land, but they're expanded upon in a fun way here. They were almost always incredibly easy pieces of what felt like filler, if I'm being honest. But in 3D world, they can be intense and difficult but incredibly rewarding to pull off in these gauntlets. The Captain Toad stages, 
mean, they're fine. These levels are little puzzle boxes you can rotate fully around. You have to collect all the green stars, but you can't jump, so you have to figure out how to traverse the environment. And I like these, but I don't feel like they add much. They're brilliant ideas, enough to get a full game, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, but that's what they feel like. Ideas that are from their own game. I feel like they're here because 3D World really likes variety. Throwing a ton of ideas out there just to make it look like this game has it all. Like what's with the baseballs? They just appear in seemingly random levels. You can toss them around and it's like, cool, but why? That's the thing with 3D World. It doesn't really have a theme and it used set to its advantage, but the variety isn't nearly as cool as if there was a theme. Like Kirby Planet Robobot is my favorite Kirby game and it's a sequel to the more general Kirby game, Kirby Triple Deluxe. With Robobot's sci-fi theme, I feel like any idea that it has creatively ties into that and makes it much more creative. I like when games have themes comparative to when they don't. 3D World has cats, but it's not really a theme as much as it's just kind of a part of the logo and a power up in the game. Some enemies are cats. That's about it. I guess that's why rats are the enemies here. They got a few fun new baddies here. Charging Chuck is back, the football player who threw baseballs in Mario World. I guess that's where the baseballs are from, but they aren't from him. The amount of power-ups is insane, like more than any other Mario title. The main headliner is the Super Bell, transforming you into Cat Mario. You can climb up walls, pounce, claw enemies. I'm really happy they put in a power-up that's main gimmick isn't just you can fly, because most of the time that's what new Mario power-ups are. Cat Mario allows you to climb up any surface, which makes exploration a treat makes me wish it was in a different game. Don't get me wrong, it works brilliantly in this game, but could you imagine this in Super Mario Odyssey, Sunshine 64? Games that have massive lived in worlds to explore, this would have been killer in those titles. Here, it's a great power up that you pretty much want on you at all times, but I just feel like the level design could have lent into it that much more. Then there's the Double Cherry, another nod to Super Mario Brothers 2, but these duplicate your character, giving you up to five clones if you nab enough cherries. So these are awesome. It is so satisfying to run around with five year character fluently. There's some really smart uses of the power up, like this area where you want to position a clone on top of a block and have another hit it to get a collectible. But then you have the number pads, asking you to bring a certain number of clones to them. These kind of just feel like the character switches to me, like bringing four clones to a pad is almost the same as saying, get to the end with the fire flower. It's still obviously harder to bring a bunch of clones to the end of the level, considering you can lose one so easily. I think I'm really nitpicking here, and that's just because this is such a fun little power up, and I wish they did more with it because it's pretty much just used for these number pads. Which is fine, of course, in multiplayer, these things don't matter because you'll just have human players replace the clones, but this is such a fun idea I wanted to see more uses for. Most of the power-ups in 3D Land return here, including the Fire Flower, Boomerang Flower, Tanuki Leaf, Invincibility Leaf after dying a certain number of times, the Star Mushroom, the Mega Mushroom, which is a bit of a cool little surprise. Doesn't appear much, and it's just kind of here because kids like when you grow big like this. I should know, I was a kid. Yeah, when this appeared in New Super Mario Brothers, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I haven't heard of Ecstasy. Now it's like, oh, he's big. Okay, I'm just gonna walk right over all the level design and not play it. Yay. To be fair, I think when they use the Mega Mushroom in 3D World, it's actually in smart areas. There's this ghost ship that really only makes sense with the Mega Mushroom in mind. The propeller box from 3D Land returns on top of various other boxes. Certain question blocks can get stuck on your head and you get loads of coins from running around. Cannon boxes shoot cannonballs out. Light boxes shine light on enemies susceptible to it. You can hop into a Koopa shell and jam around in that. Goomba masks stop enemies from charging at you. There's so much stuff here. And that's not even counting the Piranha Plant item, which you can hold as it chomps away at stuff in front of you, if 3D World is anything, it's not running out of ideas. I think the amount of power-ups is one of my favorite things about this game. A lot of Mario titles have that one power-up you always want to have, while this one, every single one is very warranted. And while I'd rather take the cat or Tanuki suit in almost any instance, something like the Boomerang Flower feels so much more useful here than it did in 3D Land. There are a few stages where you flat out need the power-up to grab a green star or stamp, like you have to throw a boomerang to grab it and that's awesome. Of course, there's also the stages that require the gamepad. Most of the game you can just use any controller you please, but a select few you need it for microphone support. The touchscreen, gyroscope, all the Captain Toad stages require it. And they use it in such lame ways, like touch this block to have it come out, blow the microphone to get rid of the enemies. You can use it during standard gameplay to Cheat. The gamepad support is pathetic, and it's made even more so because it's required for a few of those levels. I don't dislike these levels at all, they're perfectly fine, I just think the ideas they had for this thing were lame as hell. Like, you can hold the enemies in place, you can uncover secret blocks by rubbing around them. Yeah, the game also pretty much tells you when a secret block is nearby, so it's pretty much pointless. The boss fights are definitely a weak point here, too. They're all a bit overly simple, and it's just 
jump on him. Yeah, it's Mario's thing, but other boss fights in the series have been incredibly creative compared to these. I mean, I like their designs, and the Histocrat boss fight is all right. You just climb up and stomp on him, but Miley Boss Blob, hit him on his head. King Kathunk, hit him on his head. Boom, boom, pom, pom, same story. Bowser's are unique, two of his, he's in a car. It's the baseballs all over again. Like, cool, but why? You just hit the bombs back to him. Everything's more simple here, which isn't bad, but none of the bosses leave much of an impression outside of their character designs. Now, the seventh world is Bowser's castle themed. So much so, they replaced the number seven. Math is f***ed. At the end of the boss here, you rescue the seventh Sprixy princess, with them doing the classic fake out. Mario games can't get enough of pretending I don't understand what'll happen next. What? I do really like how the red screen denoting the end of the level gets peeled back with Bowser returning, capturing all the fairies and using their power combined to create Bowserland. This is the coolest part of the whole game. It looks awesome. It does show if 3D World has any theme, it's circus. It's definitely the only prominent theme throughout and Bowserland rolls with it. But like the cat suit, it just makes me wish this was in a more open Mario game. Exploring a Bowser theme park would be so cool. The final boss is easily my favorite level in the game. Bowser uses the power-ups against you, becoming a Meowser. Using the double cherries to create multiples later on, everything about this stage is incredible. It feels epic on a level that 3D World doesn't really touch outside of this one moment. It all comes together. I love the big music cues when you hit the pow blocks and when you save all the fairies and those credits roll, it feels like you just experienced history. I mean, the music always definitely helps. This is easily one of, if not the best Mario soundtrack of all time. It's really leaning into that big band style. It works so well and honestly makes certain stages major standouts here. Afterwards, you unlock World Star. Here we have some of the most creative stages out there. One where you're chasing after the flagpole, one that acts like a top-down shoot-em-up, a throwback to Mario 3D Land, and after the second stage, you unlock Rosalina as a playable character. Being the slowest, but having the spin for Mario Galaxy, acting as not only an attack, but a double jump as well. A new power-up is also available in some levels here, the Lucky Bell, a variation of the Super Bell that turns into a golden statue producing coins during a ground pound, which is... Very much like the Tanuki suit you got in the post-game of Mario 3D Land, wow! On top of this, after beating the final boss, the Luigi Brothers minigame is unlocked on the title screen. 3D World was released during the year of Luigi, the year Nintendo stock hit an all-time low. Because of that, many stages have a hidden 8-bit Luigi in them. They don't do anything, but that's very in line with how 8-bit Luigi's act. Luigi Brothers is a ROM hack of Mario Brothers on the NES, but with both characters as Luigi. It's actually unlocked from the get-go if you have new Super Luigi U saved at on your system. It's a cute inclusion, I love when games do this kind of stuff, but... Come on, it's Luigi Brothers, okay? I have better things to talk about, like World Mushroom. Afterwards, you unlock World Mushroom and Flower, which house remixed versions of previous stages, and once you get every green star, every stamp, and get to the top of every flagpole, you unlock World Crown, where the toughest stages in the game reside. A 30-star Mystery House Marathon, one last Captain Toad level, and Champion's Road. Basically, the final exam of Super Mario 3D World. I've been in a few times, that's right, I can f anybody I want, I just choose not to. To fully 100% 100% the game, you have to beat every stage as every character. F*** you, Nintendo. Once you clear every level as one character, you get a stamp for said character, and I did it as Mario, and I don't care, I 100% of this game, and I'm proud of it. Well, that's Super Mario 3D World, and I think my main problem with it initially was that it wasn't this big, epic, genre-defining title, which is what the Wii U needed at the time. It was just supposed to be a very good, typical Mario platformer made for multiplayer. But there's nothing wrong with that. I think Mario as a series has an ability that many other game series would kill to have, and that's the ability to make each game so different from one another, but at its core, they all feel like Mario games. Super Mario 3D World is a much more typical Mario game. It's much more back to basics than something like Super Mario Galaxy, but that doesn't make it inherently worse. I don't think these two really deserve to be compared to each other, but Nintendo messed up because they practically forced us to compare the two. 3D World was the only 3D Mario on Wii U. It was the system's flagship Mario campaign. And this style of 3D Mario on a console only really makes sense to ease 2D players into regular 3D Mario games. But there wasn't a regular 3D Mario game to ease those players into on the system. Thus, Nintendo made me look at everything and go, well, the GameCube had this big adventure, the Wii had these epic campaigns, and the Wii U only got this, which is more 2D Mario than 3D at times. It kind of reinforced this feeling that Nintendo wasn't trying as hard as they should have with the Wii U. They were playing it safe, especially in 2013 when this released. Instead of this being just a really cool 2D, 3D Mario hybrid with awesome multiplayer, 
they forced us to compare it to games that it really didn't deserve to be compared to. Because when you look at this as the Wii U's defining 3D Mario moment and compared to the other Nintendo systems defining 3D Mario moments, it looks much more basic and simple compared to the more open 3D Mario games. Back in the day, and many times, it felt like Nintendo wasn't trying with this game, and that wasn't the case, but it just felt like they made a mistake releasing it at the time that they did. However, soon after, we did get a return to the more open 3D Mario formula, and that made me look at 3D World in a different light. Super Mario Odyssey was everything I wanted in a new 3D Mario game rich open environments, crazy new mechanics and ideas, genuinely pushing the Mario series forward. And when I got this style of Mario in 2017, it made me appreciate 3D World a whole lot more. It no longer feels like it's lacking because it's something it's not. It now feels like the fun multiplayer Mario it was always designed to be. We have this big open game now. We have these rich non-linear worlds to explore. Super Mario 3D World isn't that. And that's okay! It's different, and it's really fun because of it. As the Wii U's only 3D Mario, it's underwhelming, there's no denying that. But as a video game in the grand scheme of Mario, I now look at it for what it truly is. A masterfully designed, undeniably fun obstacle course platformer. Which is what Mario has been since the very beginning. If anything, Super Mario 3D World is a perfect, classic-styled entry in the series. It's a shame I saw it as anything less than that. But thankfully, it's only gotten better with age, and no time was it easier to appreciate than in February 2021. You know, when Nintendo started porting every single one of their Wii U games over to the Nintendo Switch, many pointed to Super Mario 3D World being an obvious choice, especially considering Super Mario Odyssey was on the platform and New Super Mario Bros. U came over as well. With 3D World on the Switch, you'd have every area of Mario covered. The 2D games, the in-between 2D, 3D games, and the flat-out full 3D ones. That lack of a full 3D one on Wii U made 3D World feel so lacking originally. This could be the game's big chance! But each year came and won, and it felt like they're reporting anything but 3D World. Tokyo Mirage Sessions, yeah sure. Captain Toad, the follow-up to 3D World, got ported first, and they removed levels that were from 3D World from the game and retconned it being a 3D World prequel. The Switch version's supposed to be a prequel to Super Mario Odyssey now. 3D World made it into Super Mario Maker 2 as a game style, it felt like the game just made sense for Switch. Which is why I predicted it would never come over. This is Nintendo, all right? The lack of sense makes more sense sometimes. Thankfully, I was proven wrong. A part of the Super Mario Bros. 35th Anniversary Direct, the port was revealed alongside a new sub-game included in the package. Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. I don't understand the trend of putting plus in games' titles now. It felt like a lot of games started putting a cross in their title to denote crossovers, and now Nintendo's trying out plus signs. Mario plus Rabbids, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga plus Bowser's Minions, Bowser's Inside Story plus Bowser Jr.'s Journey. It's actually quite odd that this naming convention perfectly follows the Mario and Luigi remakes on 3DS. The trailer didn't show really anything new on the front of 3D World, but later on people discovered the character's running speed was increased dramatically, and there would be online multiplayer. WHY WASN'T THIS IN THE TRAILER?! Nintendo does this odd thing where they leave vital info out and in place they go, Oh, Luigi's funny. On top of that, Bowser's Fury was shown to be a dark, large, open area taking place in 3D World's engine, which is exactly what I wasn't expecting. I was anticipating the bare minimum for this board. I mean, maybe a new character? A new world of levels? That would've been fine. New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe got away with doing the bare minimum. That's like the worst Switch port they could've done. They added a new character, but removed modes. The ability to play is just Mario, Luigi, Blue Toad, and Yellow Toad. Now one of the characters has to be Toad dead, and she has an unfair advantage in the form of extra abilities. Plus, the game put in this new control mechanism where double tapping the jump button makes it twirl in the air, and that led to countless mistimed jumps where I was trying to jump, but the game registered it as a double jump and you can turn it off, but only via a cheat code. I don't like this version. If anything, the Wii U one's better. So to at the very least see 3D World get such a substantial add-on, it was promising. And later down the line on January 12th, 2021, the Bowser's Fury trailer was revealed, showing how exactly this part would operate with a full overview trailer for the full package released the very next day. Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury released a month later on February 12th, 2021 for the Nintendo Switch alongside a Mario themed Switch and two 3D World Amiibo. The reception wasn't as high, but I'm sure that's just because the hype wasn't there as much. This is just a port after all. I think 3D World is great, but a 10 out of 10 seems a bit high, and I think fans were eager for it to save the Wii U and playing it back in November 2013, I think we were all excited about it a little more for that very reason. This version, I was definitely picking up. Not only did I want to see what Bowser's Fury was all about, but see how 3D World made the jump to a non-Wii U being. Well, I had to remove a whole new world from the box considering the game is 
eight years old. So, booting the game up, we pick between 3D World and Bowser's Fury, showing these are two completely different beasts. Let's go for 3D World first. It's 3D World. But now with weird looking menus. And I don't know about this parentheses selection thing. It just looks off. They actually went in and overhauled a few UI elements, specifically ones that didn't really need an overhaul. Pretty much the entire character select screen is different. It may not look different, but they changed the sizes of icons, text, fonts are different. Even the back button is in a different place. They did a similar thing with New Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe, randomly changing some UI elements you would never really think about changing. The game now runs at a higher resolution, which isn't really a major enhancement. It's not like the game looks significant significantly better, but it does look sharper and colors pop even more than they did on Wii U. Much like with the UI elements in the menus, the ones during gameplay have been altered. They removed the time sign from coin and live counts. Good. In addition, the UI as a whole is smaller with the item in reserve icon being completely different. This time you hit up to access it. The game saving after every level is now done pretty much entirely in the background. Back on Wii U, it would pause and make you sniff. This is something I didn't realize until playing for a while. It may not seem like a big deal and the load times weren't at all on Wii U, but this adds up a ton. But when you start playing the game, the biggest change becomes painfully obvious. There's no gyro camera. Now the characters all have increased speed, 40% faster than on Wii U. This is blazing fast running speed compared to what I'm used to, and it makes the game feel radically fresh after playing on Wii U. I personally never found the original game to be too slow, but the new version definitely makes it feel that way. Though the increased speed can be a bit jarring, and I will say the original feels a bit more natural. It's more fun now, but just running and jumping on a staircase feels a bit more clunky compared to on Wii U. There, the platforms were designed with this certain top speed in mind, and now when I try to jump up a few platforms and not lose speed, it's much harder to. But it's not really a big deal, it's just something I noticed. I mean, the slowest character in the game on Switch is faster than the fastest character on Wii U, which just shows how significant this change is in the grand scheme of things, and it makes for a more fun experience overall. We got some new moves! The mid-air roll from Super Mario Odyssey is here, which is a Godsend. I cannot tell you how many times this move has saved me, hitting the crouch and run button in the air. It helps you immediately recover after making a gross jump, I love it. Something else from Odyssey is slamming down warp pipes. If you ground pound above one, you slide right in, which doesn't have much of a purpose other than pure pleasure. If you die in the Wii U game, any green stars or stamps you collected would be lost if you didn't collect them prior to hitting the checkpoint flag, and you'd have to get them all again. Now, it remembers if you nab them, so if you get them once, you don't have to worry about getting them again, you just have to beat the level to fully net them. Still doesn't give you the ability to swap characters between lives, or if you could have done that on the fly, that would have been nice. But what about the levels that use the Wii U gamepad? Say what you will about the perfect game, it doesn't use this. So originally, a few stages used the touchscreen and microphone. The Nintendo Switch has a touchscreen, it's only accessible in portable mode though. And it has absolutely no mic, which I find incredibly strange. Are the microphones like what was used on the DS, 3DS, Wii U? Are they really that expensive to include on Switch? Like I get that the blow into the mic mechanic attracts an audience you don't want anymore, but just including it for compatibility with older games would have been nice. I guess the reasoning is since the Switch would be in the dock, you'd have to implement the microphone in all the controllers, and then on top of that, if they'd want to implement more legacy gimmicks like a camera again, uh, now it would have to be on the controllers. If you'd want a touchscreen during gameplay, well, just buy the damn Wii U. Nobody else did. These levels in 3D World on Switch have been altered slightly. Platforms that would require you to blow into the microphone now just move automatically, which kind of just makes them feel pointless. There's not much challenge here. At least with these stages on Wii U, the challenge was endurance. For the touch screen, you can still touch the screen in handheld mode, but in TV mode, Hello, old friend. Hitting the R button displays a gyro cursor in which hitting the R button again registers as a touch. So that's how we do touchscreen support, which is far better than how Captain Toad on Switch did it. The cursor was on the screen the entire damn time and it was blinking. 3D World, you click it in and eventually it goes away. But this allows all players in multiplayer to use the pointer. Everybody can click R, I've read our rights. Only the gamepad player could originally do this and now it feels much more fair while also feeling much dumber. These levels were already pretty bogus on Wii U, now they just feel completely stupid. Like imagine the kids playing this game, they haven't even been taught the letter U, let alone the Wii variant. They're gonna play the stage and just be like, why do I have to do this? However, it is an upgrade in my opinion. It was a necessary step to take ensuring the game to live in anything but a casket. But this upgrade helped another element out. The Captain Toad stages are now multiplayer. These used to be single player only levels, which worked based on how they were designed, but when the rest of the game was multiplayer focused, it felt odd. See, that's why I said these stages felt like they were from a different game. At the very least, I think if the other players could control cursors or something to interact with the level, that would have made sense. But now, straight up, you all control toads. The courses weren't designed with this many players in mind, but if you're playing multiplayer, this is obviously a huge improvement. But those toads, 
are the only new playable characters, which seems like a missed opportunity. There's really no true new content included in 3D World, it's mostly just improvements to the core gameplay. Pauline was a character I thought would work the best as a 6 playable, since Rosalina was included as a reference to Mario Galaxy using Mario's attack from that game. I thought Pauline could be a reference to Mario Odyssey and she could fling a hat as her special ability. Some people thought Toadette or Daisy would be playable, well turns out we were born in the Toad with Glasses timeline. Weirdly enough, we have one new power up locked behind the brand new Amiibo support. Alongside the game came Cat Mario and Cat Peach Amiibo, based completely off of the promotional art for the game. This seemed like a pretty unnecessary addition, but it does kind of make 3D World feel rounded out, finally becoming the game it was always meant to be. I mean, it launched a year before Amiibo, it's surprising the original wasn't updated with support. Scanning Cat Mario will get you the Invincibility Bell, a variant of the Super Bell that just makes you invulnerable to enemies. Cat Peach will just give you a random power up, which also could include the Invincibility Bell, so this is for work, this is for pleasure. Random amiibo used will give you a 1-up, and Mario series amiibo will give you a star. Was it worth it? I'm sure Nintendo sees amiibo as just excuses to sell figurines at this point. They're not really trying to give them legitimately cool features. Sometimes they accidentally put cool features behind them, and I don't think they meant to. They keep flip-flopping on them. One year they're barely utilized, the next they use them all the time. And 3D World's amiibo support? is pretty much non-existent. I'm sure some people didn't even know it had Amiibo support. The Miiverse functionality is gone, meaning you can't make posts based on the level you just played, and Ghost Meats don't appear. That is a bit of a shame, as it devalues the stamps a bit. It doesn't really matter, though, because stamps are fundamentally just screen stars with fun art like behind them. But here's the thing. The stamps have been fully colorized now, which isn't something I was expecting. And you can use them in the game's photo mode. You can pause at any time, line up a shot, and you can blast the stamps in the environment. I mean, I don't use this. I'd rather vandalize actual walls. But it's a smart repurposing of the stamps and the fact they went in and colorized them all is really cool to me. They went above and beyond here to ensure this version of 3D World is as definitive as it could be. They even remembered Luigi Brothers and it doesn't look like ass this time. They used a far nicer emulator. Any NES game on Wii U looks horrendous. Here everything is crisp and clear and it unlocks after the final boss. Even though New Super Luigi U is on Switch, it doesn't unlock if you have save data for your system sadly, but it's still here. And online multiplayer. Who the f are you? Yes, you can play a local game with everybody on their own Switch or play with friends online. It would have been nice if you could have played with random people, but since 3D World still doesn't have free-for-all multiplayer modes where you just jump in, play a few stages, and boom, see who wins, this makes sense. That still would have been a really nice addition. I mean, New Super Mario Bros. U has modes like that, so come on. Well, the online works about as well as online would work for a Nintendo game. It's really hit or miss. I mean, I'm not one to be that upset. I've never had the biggest problems with online in Nintendo games. It could obviously be far better, but it does the job. They didn't have to include it. The fact they did kind of raises more questions like, well, if you see value in this, why the hell aren't you making it better? But it's here, it can work, and I'd rather have the option than not. This is incredibly impressive. 3D World is basically all here and remastered to perfection and anything taken out is very incidental. The ports like New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe took out so much while something like this shows how much Nintendo cares about 3D World. They were willing to improve so much about the game but also wanted to keep as much as possible intact from the Wii U release. Small things like colorizing the stamps, multiplayer in the Captain Toad stages, the speed increase, it all adds up to making this one of the most impressive ports of a game I've ever experienced. And that's not even half the story. Like, Jesus Christ, I like this game now. Just stop. This release is called Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury after all, and it's included via a separate option on the title screen. This is its own beast. It's based on 3D World, but playing one has no effect on playing the other. They could have just released this by itself. Bowser's Fury, right off the bat, has a much darker tone. Made sure to take note of that. Good morning, pants pissed. We get a cutscene reminiscent of 3D World's opening, though the animation looks a little stiffer here. The sun rises as Mario walks around and sees Tar. Good morning, pants pissed. Bowser's f***ing pissed. He's large as sh I have full camera control, it's my grandma's worst nightmare. Yeah, so Bowser's Fury uses Mario's same moveset from 3D World. You still hold the run button, you get the same power-ups, so you have more than 8 directional movement and you have full camera control. It feels like Mario Odyssey! The camera control was initially set to be really not sensitive enough though, you kinda have to finick with it a bit in the settings. But yeah, I pissed off Bowser, but I grabbed a cat shine to scare him off. You're hired. Afterwards, you meet up with Bowser Jr. who teams up with you because Bowser's just too pissed. Now why is Bowser like this? What happened? Well, you'll have to go to the game's instruction manual for info on that.
The story, it's kind of there, but this is more of an experiment than actual Mario game. Basically, it takes assets from 3D World and creates an open world, non-linear platforming experience out of them. This is Lake Lapcat and it has more cat themed things than 3D World can claim to. Yet for some reason, this entire area is themed around cats. Pretty much every enemy is now cat themed. These kittens appear that all have colors correlating with the playable characters in 3D World. What does this amount to? Bullshit. I think they might be trying to overcompensate for the lack of connection between 3D World and Bowser's Fury. Like, these games have a few things in common, but at the end of the day, it just shows how you can take all these assets from one and make them completely different in another just by recontextualizing them. Plus, it used to be just for slide levels, but now she's used as a means of transportation from one island to another. Power-ups are all the same, but now you can store them and access them whenever you want, making them feel more like parts of your moveset rather than power-ups. Bowser's Fury feels like the answer to my lust for what I wanted 3D World to be when it initially released. Combining three different grassy plane stages to make one big one? Bowser's Fury is basically an amalgamation of a dozen 3D world stages laid out amongst the large world map, and you have to travel to each of them yourself rather than select it on a stage select screen. You have cat shines to collect, which are pretty much moons from Odyssey, shines from sunshine, power stars from Galaxy or 64. Complete a mission, get a cat shine, and each mission is pretty similar to something you'd see in Odyssey. Usually get to the end of a platform challenge or collect a certain amount of things, defeat all the enemies, etc, etc. Other cat shines you get by just exploring and finding them throughout the world. And with the help of Bowser Jr., that becomes easier to accomplish. Either a second player can control him or the computer can. You can decide how often he helps out or just flat out get rid of the kid. I opted for a little bit of help from him, mainly because I found that to be the true Bowser's Fury experience. And he pretty much just found some secrets, which you can point out to him using the gyro pointer or took out random enemies every now and then. It's cool Bowser Jr.'s in this game as you two have to work together, but the story cutscenes feel really weird considering there's text and 3D World refuses to have story via text. It just goes to show that these are two separate games. Games. It just so happens Bowser's Fury has the same Mario model, moveset, power-ups, enemies, gimmicks, themes, and is included in the same package. What the hell am I playing? But there's so much this game takes from Odyssey. I mean, specifically when you get a shine, that's the damn Odyssey animation. The map's user interface is similar, even the way Bowser Jr. asks for Mario's help invokes vibes from Odyssey's opening. But Odyssey was all about exploration. I feel like the platforming challenges Bowser's Fury is full of reminds me more of Mario Galaxy and the tropical setting scream sunshine without even talking about how the collectibles are called shines. Bowser's Fury combines every form of 3D Mario and still makes it unique. It's crazy how this is so based on 3D World, but feels almost completely different. And Bowser can be blamed for that, as every so often, Bowser's Fury is unleashed. Damn! It just happens while you're playing the game. Bowser just becomes furious, and you just have to deal with it, either by collecting a shine that'll scare him off, or just waiting things out. Eventually, he'll go back to sleep. But this is such a fun mechanic. It forces you to stay on your toes. You don't know when Bowser's coming back. It could be... Son of a bitch! Fury instills a certain fear in the player, unlike other Mario games but it does get old after a bit. Sometimes you just want to complete a mission and all Bowser does is kind of annoy the shit out of you. When you collect a certain amount of cat shines, you can become Giga Cat Mario, which is how you actually fight Fury Bowser, and it's a good time. Nothing that mind blowing, kind of goes along with the idea that kids love big. They do that a few times, keep collecting cat shines, and we'll say at some points, Bowser's Fury becomes kind of repetitive and monotonous. Since there's multiple challenges in each little area, after you get one cat shine, normally you have to leave the area and come back for the next cat shine challenge to appear. And after a while of having to traverse water, and there's a lot of water, it can become a little tedious. But it's a short campaign, roughly three hours, and the final boss... Christ. Riding Plessy chasing after Bowser with the rock music blaring in the background covering elements of Bowser's theme from 3D World? Alright, what the hell is this? Is it a sequel? A prequel? A side story? Because this is 3D World and not 3D World at the same time. But speaking of the music, my god, it may even top 3D Worlds. There's so many just purely amazing tracks that just invoke a sense of joy or fear. They're unbelievable. The visuals also just look fantastic. They take the 3D World art style and make it actually appealing. And the game does that with so many of 3D World's games. It makes it feels like Plessy, the clear pipes, the propeller box. They feel like their purpose is finally fulfilled in Bowser's Fury. This is a fantastic little treat. An open world Mario game with basically 3D world stages as locations to visit. It's a joy to play through and they didn't even have to make it. 3D world would have been just fine on its own, but what Bowser's Fury does is turn a great port into a must buy for everybody. No matter what kind of Mario fan you are, there's something for you here. Whether it's the open sandbox style of games or the linear course clear type ones, 3D World plus Bowser's Fury is not only the definitive version of 3D World, it may just be the definitive Mario package. It stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with something like Super Mario All-Stars being a go-to experience to just understand what the hell this is. And honestly, even though prior to Bowser's Fury's release I felt this way, 
I think it made 3D World make a whole lot more sense. 3D World used to be a bit of a disappointment on Wii U, but now that it doesn't have the expectations of being a revolutionary 3D Mario hellbent on saving a struggling system, now that we have fundamentally all styles of mainline Mario covered with 2D, 3D, and the style of 2D, and full 3D, it's easier to appreciate this game for what it is a masterclass in platforming. It's nothing that'll blow you away, but it's one of the most fun Mario games ever created with little to no downtime. Every second is a joy. While it may not have the impact of something along the lines of Mario Odyssey, it wasn't meant to. Not everything needs to be on that level. And considering everything this game set out to do, I think it succeeded big time. I've had a lot of history with this game, and while I flip flop between loving it and being more critical, in the end, I care about this one so much. It may not be my favorite Mario game, but as the years went on, I appreciate it more and more. But they didn't fix the poppin' and sprawling savannah. You weren't this close.